morning, good morning, good morning. So, how, so I want to get everybody to stand up, stand up. It's early. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. We, oh, we, got, we, we, we do need some music, but we, we, we're going to act like we got music. So I just want you to repeat after me. Power of the ballot. Power of the ballot. Power of the ballot. Power of the ballot. Power of the buck. Power of the buck. Power of the buck. Power of the buck. Power of the book. Power of the book. Power. Power. Then black power. Black power. You may be seated. <laughs> so we remember why we're here, right? It's about power, power for our people. I'm Melanie Campbell, President and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation and convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. Welcome to those in the room and those who are watching to our inaugural annual Southern Organizing Leadership Convening. Our theme, I will repeat, is power of the ballot. Had twisted up a little bit, power of the book and power of the buck. Uh, that was not something I coined, and I, want, I think it bears repeating, it was Maynard Jackson used to talk about that, and he got that uh, from his grandfather, John Wesley Dobbs, and he saw that the power of the ballot, the book and the buck, was a pathway to liberation of our people, and I do believe that still, still reigns true. Um, I'm gonna ask our founding uh, director for the uh, National Coalition's Thomas W. Dorsch Jr. Institute at Clark Atlanta to bring greetings. And following him, you will hear uh, inspiration from another alum uh, of Clark Atlanta University, Clark College, uh, that's Sister Diane Forsh, who will bring our inspiration class of 74. And she happened to be my big sister, too. <laughs> good morning, good morning and welcome back to the campus of Clark Atlanta University. It is indeed a great morning for us all. We launched on yesterday uh, the Thomas W. Dorch Institute, you know, for leadership, civic engagement, economic empowerment, social justice. And it's going to be a full agenda of opportunities, discovery, and hard work. We did not do this alone. It was a vision of the board of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation several years ago to expand their operations into the South. It took us about a year to put the programming together and so I am also joined and they are in this audience today by three significant personalities who will each take on the responsibility as senior advisors to usher in a particular area of emphasis. So we have Dr. Elsie Scott, who will be dealing with our leadership and our fellows program. We have Ms. Jocelyn Tate, <laughs> who is doing the digital equity piece. She's actually an expert in that area. And if you've never heard about this splendid young lady, Ms. D. Marshall, she's ushering our economic um, empowerment track as well. And there will be a couple of other senior advisors joining us as we continue to build our programming. The beautiful part of this is that we have a mandate by our president. We are going to be working very intimately also with our state leaders because our state leaders and partners are the backbone of what we do. So on behalf of the Institute, on behalf of all of my team members, at the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. We welcome you this morning, and when you're in Atlanta, stop by the Institute. There's probably something new going on when you come, and we welcome you all to be critics of what we do, to bring your ideas to us, and we are most thankful for that. Have a great day. Little sister taking care of big sister. <laughs> I thank God. 
Thank God for them all. I will uh, be reading Jeremiah 29 and 11, NIV. Yeah. For I know the plans I have for you, declareth the Lord. They are plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And it is so good to see God's plan unfolding. I have sat and I've watched over the years the things that my sister has done and fussed and say get some rest. And I've seen so many in here blossom and come together, young and old, to make a better life for us and our children. Keep up the good work. Keep pulling hard. Persevere. Love as you go along the way. Now we'll bow our heads for just a moment. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the many hours that they spend, leaders, young and old, trying to put things together and events together, Heavenly, Fo Heavenly Father, so that we can have a better life. We thank you for them, Heavenly Father, and ask that you look over them, keep them safe, and give them the strength to press on no matter what. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Give my sister a, a, a round of love. And now I believe um, I'm turning over to somebody. Who's my turn? Uh, we will have our, I'm going to shift a little bit timing because we're not starting right on time. We'll turn this over to uh, for the, uh, our uh, first uh, strategy and organizing session, Power of the Ballot, Rights, Freedoms, Justice, Organizing, uh, who will be facilitated by Joy Cheney, Senior Policy Advisor for the Black Women's Roundtable and National Coalition. Uh, Joy, and you, and you can uh, bring on your panel morning, of lead everyone. discussants. Join me on this day. Okay. You got it, you're still using the one from yesterday. Take a look at this program. There have been some changes. We want to make sure you all are up to date. We also want to thank Angelo. He is in here. We want to thank Kara. We want to thank all the team, all the team. And we also want to thank Melanie Campbell. One of the questions we had yesterday was who in the room has been helped or centered? Come on up. Helped or centered um, or prioritized and loved by Melanie Campbell. If that's happened to you, can you raise your hand? There are new people here today, and we want to make sure we continue to ask that question and to answer it. Melanie, we want to give you your flowers right now because you deserve it and we love you. 
Melanie has been inviting me and asking me to moderate for a very long time and to speak for a very long time. And so I'm going to do it right today. We're going to go for about an hour. And I want to introduce, you know, our fantastic panelists and let them introduce themselves. Right here on the end, we have the fabulous Victoria Kirby Burke, who's, yes, Deputy Executive Director and Director of Public Policy and Programs at the National Black Justice Coalition. I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about it later, but we're going to introduce next my soul war, Sheena Matthews, who's also the Director of Movement Partnerships and Engagement at Planned Parenthood Action Fund and Planned Parenthood. Hello, hello, hello. And sir, next, next to you, I can't even, hello, is that Reverend Lee? No. no. Oh, all the way down, I can't see. Hi. Well, sir, introduce yourself. There have been some changes on the panel, so I don't know who it's. Well, hello, 100 black men. <laughs> we have Stan Savage, board member of 100 Black Men of America Incorporated. We actually have some really edgy questions for you. Uh, is Amara on? There you are. Amara Candy, the, uh, Kennedy is National Director, Community Engagement, AIDS Healthcare Foundation, and the chair of the Black Leadership AIDS Crisis Coalition, acronym BLACK. We also, next to the stand, we have my good friend, Tanya Clayhouse, who is the Vice President of the Hip Hop Caucus. Uh, and Hip Hop Caucus has been around for a long time, but Tanya has breathed new life into its public policy program, and I look forward to talking to her about it. We also have, I think we've, we've I'm gonna save my good friend, uh, Siobhan to the end, but just in the, in just know she's coming. We have Reverend Lee, two, two ministers on here. We have Reverend Tony Lee, board member of the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation and member of the Black Church PAC. And then finally, I, I'm ending with her because I want to continue to celebrate her inaugural year as president and CEO of the National Coalition of Negro Women. National Council of Negro Women, NCNW. <laughs> Siobhan has been doing this work a long time, but this is the first time NCNW has ever had a president and CEO in this particular capacity, and it has also breathed new life into their leadership and their public policy program, and we exalt her and celebrate her and congratulate her on this new role. <laughs> this is our panel. Did I miss anybody? Wait! Felicia! Director of the HBCU Green Fund, and also a convener of the Georgia Black Women's Roundtable. Woohoo! All right, guys, this the, we, we have a very long panel, but we are going to keep it moving. The purpose of our panel today is to really bring together some of the ideas that we talked about yesterday. We talked a lot about strategy. Today, we're going to talk about policy right and solutions what are the things that we ought to be fighting for what are the challenges of fighting for those things have we asked ourselves are those the priorities of african americans are the priorities of black women black men or both right and where do those things converge and where are they different and what is our what's our game plan what should be the things that we are asking for and that we are helping to educate our community about in the next couple of months and really years. As we learned yesterday, we don't want it to all be about 2024. And we all can't be telling them what they should be supporting. But all of these groups have boots on the ground and have been gathering intel and having conversations about what are important to the communities that we serve. And so I want to kick things off with um, Siobhan, with Reverend Airline Bradley. Airline Bradley. Um, and I want to ask you, have you been asking your members what are their priorities? What are the top three? I know you all do a lot at NCNW, but what are the top three that you would identify that your members have said are important to them as we go into these next important years? So first of all, thank you all for the opportunity. And shout out to my Sora Mill. Um, we've got an entire um, obligation to black women uh, together. And so it's so great to be here with my 
fellow brothers and sisters. So uh, we actually just finished this process uh, at NCNW yeah. uh, with our board and um, our affiliates. NCNW has 33 affiliates, one which is, of course, this organization is affiliated with NCNW. Uh, and so when the board met, uh, the priorities that we walked away with started here. Uh, equal pay for black women is 100% about to be on the top of our list. I will tell you, July 27th is so important for us because that recognizes that it takes a woman that is black in this country 18 months to make the same salary of a white male who only works for 12 months. And so the date, July 27th, is so important because we are realizing that the connection between a black woman's economics is connected to also the way that she functions in healthcare and economics as well as in education. The second one for us is going to be reproductive justice. And I want to be clear as a preacher who is pro-choice, I'm very fine, I'm fine with saying that, I'm a pro-choice preacher, but everyone is not in that space in their theology, and that's okay. But what I believe we're all in alignment with is constitutional rights and autonomy for your own body. Constitutional rights for a woman is as American as apple pie for me. In the context of a woman's right, there should be no government, no man, no person that can decide for me what I do for myself. Your own conviction between you and the Lord is absolutely appropriate because your convictions are what God has given you. But for the government to make a defined decision without a complete disregard for my own autonomy is quite frankly unconstitutional. So the basis of the way our country was built is around how we make decisions. And what's interesting to me, because I'm not partisan, but I am factual. <laughs> my facts tell me that it's interesting when I see certain individuals who align with certain parties want big government sometimes and then sometimes they don't. Yeah. And when it comes to the rights of women, there seems to be an, an interest in infringing on individual rights. So equal pay for black women is a priority for us. We're going to be dealing with reproductive justice and alignment there. Uh, here's the third area, though, and this has really been a, a larger conversation. And that's been this connection with how do we engage the, econ the economy and voting rights as a co aligned conversation. So student loan debt has actually come to the forefront more than I even thought it would. What we are finding is that there are more seniors that are asking me about student loan debt now than they ever have been before because there are still seniors paying off their debts. Right. And their, children. and their children's debts. And I'm gonna say it this way, their grandchildren's debts. Yes. If you live in, in, the, in the context of black people, our, we are very intergenerational anyway. We wake up intergenerational. Because we, we, we got good skin, we got good, we got good style. So our grandmothers are still living, our great-grandmothers are still living, our great-grandfathers are still living, along with their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So what happens is that economic, really, uh, accountability falls on all those generations. And so as we're looking at equal pay, as we're looking at student loan debt, as we're looking at reproductive justice, uh, that conversation for me is connected to voting rights and constitutionality. So NCNW is committed to that. Yes. Uh, and we have a number more priorities, but those are the top three that have really hit the surface for us. Uh, and our ability to be able to engage is going to be a, a larger discussion around public safety. And how many of you all are surprised by that answer, just by a show of hands? Anyone? Well, not in this room. But I bet there are people out there who might have, if they were speaking for, black women might have given a different set. And that is why we thank NCNW and Black Women's Roundtable, right, that Melanie leads, for having that conversation and actually asking us what we think. I will note um, that Black Women's Roundtable and NCNW are leading the nation's effort and campaign around Black Women's Equal Pay Day this year, and it's an important one. I'm working on that a little bit, so. <laughs> it's an important one because it's the 60th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act, and it marks a time where we can really have an, a conversation about what it would take to close the, the wage gap. We'll talk about that maybe if we have a little time. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you. Stan, I wanna go to you. Um, Mr. Savage, and I just wanna talk about what black men's priorities are. We don't wanna make any assumptions about what you all care about. What is the 100 black men identified as the priorities of black men? Uh, thank you for the question. Good morning. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, you know, thank Clark College for hosting this particular forum and just to say hello to all those familiar faces and also to give a shout out to my fellow board member, Dr. Wes Bellamy, who is our public policy chair with 100 Black Men of America. 
You know, uh, 100 black men since 1963, our, our core mantra has been uh, mentoring. Uh, it was then and it still is today. Um, uh, mentoring our young black youth that are still facing a number of disparities, uh, you know, over these last few decades. And so uh, that continues to be our main focus. Um, and in addition to that, uh, you know, sustainability and leadership. Uh, I think all of you guys can uh, attest to the fact that over the last 10 years, uh, we've lost some, some very, very powerful uh, icons uh, in our community. And so uh, for us to continue to struggle, uh, you know, the needle has not moved enough. It's moved some, but it really hasn't moved enough. And so uh, we not only have to uh, invest in our youth, but we also have to provide leadership. We've made a significant uh, contribution in, le in leadership uh, to sustain our organization. Um, we actually have a leadership institute. Uh, we're looking at uh, those next generational leaders, such as the Dr. Wes Bellamy and some of the other individuals that we have in our organization so that we can continue this uh, very, very important uh, struggle. Uh, obviously, we, we face some of the same challenges um, uh, unfortunate that we've we faced as a black 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 people for several decades, and so uh, we have to strategize. We have to form coalitions uh, with individuals who uh, will definitely be with us in the struggle. Um, my mentor Tommy Dorsey used to often say that there are uh, those of our kind that are not of our color, but there are those of our color that are not of our kind, and so we have mm. to take those responsibilities and take that mantra to effect for us to continue to be effective in our communities. And we welcome a uh, coalition with everybody in this room, uh, young, old, black, female, everybody, so, us, so we can get to that other side. That's wonderful. Thank you. Let's give him a hand to clap for that. <laughs> Felicia, I want to go to you next, though, because one of the things I didn't hear was a lot, I heard sustainability of leadership, but not necessarily environmental sustainability. And, and, and in the green space. And I know that's one of the things that you've been working on for the vast majority of your career. Where should we place environmental issues, especially issues of water, right, in our priority list as we go forward, especially in these next couple of months and years? So, so um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, and I'm glad to be on with a Hip Hop Caucus because I'm sure we, <laughs> we get two bites of the apple today, yes. which is unusual. Um, let, I, certainly, we all know, and black people in general, black women specifically, have always placed environmental sustainability top of our list. We are people of the land. We are people that understand the impact of our environment on everything else. So we have been in that space, we um, show up in that space, but we've not typically been in the leadership. And it's our leadership that brought justice into the conversation, right? Prior to that, it was all about the polar bears, even the water, and we know the water, but for us it's the water, the impact on people. But right now, I'm gonna shift just a bit to say where we need to be in the moment. So this administration has something called Justice 40. How many people out there are familiar with Justice 40? So, wonderful thing. It says 40% of certain monies should benefit, in air quotes, uh, disadvantaged communities. And disadvantage is not defined by race, but defined by characteristics that still make most of our communities eligible. But it's functioning in billions. Generally speaking, we don't have entities that can readily draw down billions. So it's what do we do in the moment? How do we organize, coordinate, and collaborate in a way that we are determining what's happening with at least that 40% that is to dark target our communities. That means we are sitting here at Clark Atlanta University. We are talking about an institute aligning with an institution that has the capacity to be as big as we can think. And if we do that across our institutions, we have an opportunity 
to advance sustainability for our communities in ways that will determine the next century. We are transitioning from fossil fuels to new energy. We're all aware of it. There will be electric vehicles. They will have to charge someplace. We need to be in line with what's coming next so that we don't have to advocate on the gap. We need to move in a manner to ensure that we don't have a disparity. We don't have a gap. The time is now. That means we have to empower young people by our institutions and not focus on colleges and universities first because they're big enough and they own property. Right. And then I go to our faith community second because they're big enough, they're bad enough, and they also own property. So I just put Justice 40 on the table, but it will be those of us from the NGO nonprofit community that have the bandwidth to drive where that planning needs to go. So I'll stop there because I know my good sister is going to bring it on home oh, yes. in terms of environment right behind me. So I've got a lot more to say on that, but I'll stop there. Let me tell you what, the Hip Hop Caucus has been leading, but the HBCU Green Fund has been as well. And let me tell you, if you, uh, some of you all raised your hand when you understood Justice 40, but if you don't understand Justice 40, we can get you more information about it. It's a great example of also why elections matter, matter. right? Um, because had we ever heard of anyone trying to dedicate 40% of the funding towards disadvantaged communities before? No. And that is tremendous, and that money is making its way out there, and we need to make sure that we are getting access to those funds, and our communities are, and our organizations are. So more on that. And I'm going to go to Tanya, but in a second, because I want to get out a baseline of all the issues that we're dealing with. And I'd like to go to Victoria, because we've talked about black women and black men. But I also want to talk about the black women and black men who intersect with sexual orientation and gender identity. Tell me about your organization. Tell me what are the priorities of your community that you serve. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I felt that from the belly. I, I see that spirit in the room. Yes. My name is Victoria Kirby York. I share, and I work with the National Black Justice Coalition. We're the leading civil rights organization focused on the black LGBTQ plus and same gender loving community. And before I get too deep into our priorities, I do want to make sure I don't forget to shout out uh, Tony Michelle Williams from SNAPCO, who does work on uh, solutions, not punishment, here in Atlanta and her team. And also Elder Kamarion Anderson, uh, who works with the Human Rights Campaign and the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, representing Alabama over there, but does a lot Raise of work your hands nationally. a little higher so everyone can see you all. Yes, all right. glad to have you all in the space. Um, one of my favorite Martin Luther King quotes since Trump was elected president in 2016 that sits with me a lot is that there is such a thing as being too late. Sometimes when we talk about the fierce urgency of now, shout out to James Baldwin, we forget that that urgency can have a time limit. Mm. Don't let ignorance be your excuse. Don't let lack of knowledge about a community different from yours that's still a part of you be what makes us too late. Going to lay out a few reasons why. When we talk about what's of most importance to the black LGBTQ plus and same gender loving community, it's about deep collaboration between black organizations focused on black communities and organizations that sit at the intersection, like ours, doing race work and work around sexual orientation and gender identity. Organizations like NBJC became necessary because black civil rights organizations <laughs> kicked us out the room because we were too queer, too trans, too, too gender nonconforming. But then also the LGBTQ movement kicked us out the room because we were too black, too much color. And so when policies were drafted, they were often drafted without us at the table, without us in mind, which meant it didn't always flow to reach us. That's on the progressive side, right? When we look at 
some more of the more conservative actors, and I acknowledge the point made by Hit Strategies yesterday, that conservative means different things to different people, yeah. right? So I don't, when, I, when I'm speaking of it, I mean, <laughs> extreme is like far on the other side. Not the way we talk about pragmatic black conservatives in our families. What we see them doing is saying and marketing that they're coming for trans kids, trans adults, LGBTQ people. And what they end up, and, and they do it to try to recruit black men. They're really bold and honest about that. You can see, you see that in some of what the data said yesterday. What they end up doing is gutting civil rights protections we fought for 50 years ago. When we talk about the gutting of voting rights and the Voting Rights Act, what we also need to be talking about is the gutting of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that has been happening starting with the hero fight in Houston, the, human, the, the equal rights ordinance in 2015 that would have provided protections in the third largest city in the nation that has a, a very high black population that ended up not getting passed to include protections for black people women, military veterans, because they ran bathroom ads, scaring people, saying, well, if you get, give equal protection to everybody, you're going to have to deal with people coming in the bathroom doing bad things, which is legal already, let's be clear, right? Um, but they were trying to use our, the LGBTQ community as the boogeyman, and at the end of the day, stopped black people as a whole from getting protections that they need in Texas, a state that does not have state protections for our community. We saw that with HB2 in North Carolina, where the headline, again, was bathrooms, stopping transgender people from using bathrooms. Folks been using for decades with no issues, right? <laughs> But what they didn't say, the quiet part, that they, they kept quiet in this instance, was that they also gutted state employment non-discrimination courts in North Carolina so black people couldn't file employment discrimination claims. That was in the same bill, right? We see that happening right now, where they're talking about gender-affirming care for young people, about 4,000 youth in this nation who require it. We're talking about mental health services. In most cases, we're not talking about surgery, right? But that's what, right. that's what the, the headline is. But the precedent they're setting is gutting protections for health care that's government funded. So we already know the way this story is going. When you look at uh, provisions that black folks need in Medicaid, in Medicare, in the VA, the thing is, once you start a precedent and say that something's okay and there's no backlash, they are going to keep coming for more. Ask the abortion rights folks. That didn't happen overnight. It was a, a chipping away. They started out with don't say gay in Florida two years ago. What happened the year after? Don't say black. Right. Also known as the Stop Woke Act. I don't call it that because there's nothing wrong with being woke. Everybody need, need to wake up. Right? And now we see them stripping diversity, equity, and inclusion funding from colleges all throughout Florida. What do you think is next? Our HBCUs. You have to follow the line. For those of you in the divine nine, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. You have to follow the line. They're not going to say the quiet part out loud. They're trying to recruit black conservatives. They're trying to recruit us while gutting us at the same time, and it will be too late if we don't wake up. So that deep collaboration is issue number one for NBJC. And that requires some education, because some folks just don't know. If you need a 101, I got you. I'm here all day. <laughs> the economy is important. Number two, family rejection to poverty pipeline is real in our community. When families kick out their kids because they've invited them in and let them know that I identify as gay or trans or non-binary, those kids end up on the streets. They end up becoming sex workers, they, which is to each their own. Some people enjoy the profession. But what I'm saying is the choice is taken away. Theft is another way that people end up having to survive. So that ends up giving our young people a record before the age of 18. We already know what happens when you have to mark that box on an application form. So you have young people from as early as 13 years old on their own 
in the streets. You can watch the documentary, check it, to learn a little bit about, that ex about some of that experiences. And, and so I don't want to take too much time, but that's a black issue. We can't legislate loving our children and affirming our children. That's something we have to take care of in-house. When we look at hate crimes, and, we, and, and my trans sisters always correct me on this. Whenever I say we got to look at the epidemic of murders facing black transgender women, they always pull me to the side and say, sis, I see what you're doing, but let's talk about the epidemic of murders and missing black women as a whole, cisgender and transgender, because black femininity, black womanhood, is, is seen as a disposable trait regardless if you're cisgender or transgender. And we need to figure out what's going on with our law enforcement agencies and hate crime statutes that they're not being implemented in a way that we're taking seriously what is happening to the, the members of our community who are being disposed of with no mention on the news. Victoria, I'm gonna jump in here. What you are saying is so right, right? All of these issues are intersectional and they almost know us better than sometimes we know ourselves and they enter in, but this is the same playbook they've been doing and they use one issue and oftentimes it is in the same bill. We're gonna talk 70s. about that. That's right, same bill. Sheena, I wanna go to you next because I mean, you know, Victoria called you in <laughs> and I know you're gonna talk about reproductive justice. We know what Planned Parenthood's, you know, chief priority in this moment is. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about why this is so important in the South? We are sitting in the South. This is a Southern convening. Can we talk about the reproductive health care disparity that's happening in the South and how it's related to some of the things we've already talked about today? Yes, and thank you so much, Sora, for having me, and thank you for Melanie for having me as well. Um, so what's at, what's at stake right now um, is the access to reproductive health care, and that includes abortion access. So right now, um, you will see that in the South and Midwest. If you look at a map, it's, it's a map. Mm -hmm. The same actors that are attacking voting rights are the same ones attacking in the South reproductive health care and access to abortion. So when we talk about the South, um, we know this is a Bible state, right? We know that we have state legislators who are making laws to restrict or ban access to uh, care that impact that goes against, I would say, their, what their constituents want. So when we talk about the South, you know how it intersects. Just keep in mind that map, what you see, the same actors who are attacking voting rights are the same ones attacking access to reproductive health care. And LGBTQ rights. So Sheena and I, uh, and her colleagues at Planned Parenthood, along with Melanie and, and NCNW at the time, Siobhan wasn't there, but her predecessor, we brought together a group at the White House with the Vice President leading to talk about the intersection of those three things, voting rights, reproductive justice, and LGBTQ rights, and attacks all the same states, and, and deep, deep disparities in particularly those communities. Um, Tanya. I want to come to you because the Hip Hop Caucus, uh, you know, Felicia had already kind of queued up. You all lead on the environmental justice issues for the black community, which we thank you for. But you all are expanding that capacity. Tell us about what you do first and tell us about what your priorities are. So I first, again, thank you to Melanie for always inviting me and including me. Thank you, Joy, for managing. I know how it is um, as a moderator, so I appreciate that, and I'll, I'll be awaiting my cutoff point. Um, <laughs> so, my, again, Tanya Clayhouse. Um, I'm the executive vice president uh, of the Hip Hop Caucus, a position that was created when I came in in order to really capitalize on the expansion of the caucus. The caucus has been around for 19 years. We will be celebrating our 20th anniversary next year, so we're readily preparing for that. Yeah, you can clap about that. <laughs> um, and as you all, many of you know, this year was, is also the celebration of the 50th anniversary of hip hop. And so we've got a lot of things that are converging here, and that goes to the intersectionality, what has already been discussed, about the variety of issues impacting the black community. 
So what is it that I do? What is it that the Hip Hop Caucus does? Well, the caucus was originally founded after the 2000 election uh, as part of, there was, if you all recall, this concept, P. Diddy, Jay-Z, vote or die, because vote or die. Now, that is a concept that still exists every single day. For, and yeah. Let's every just talk day. about that, because <laughs> it just is. But out Especially of that, during the pandemic. Yes. <laughs> Literally. Yes. <laughs> but that it evolved out of that concept and the understanding that our people have to be engaged and involved every single day because it is our livelihood that's at stake. And so the Respect My Vote campaign was our first campaign. It, that was the first, um, that, that was how we were founded uh, 19 years ago. But as we were engaging in the community, what became quite clear as we're working with not just, and let me just be clear, when we say hip hop caucus, it's not just we're engaging the hip hop generation. Everybody thinks that, okay, you're gonna get these influencers and celebrities to come in. I was like, okay, yeah, but not every Beyonce is gonna go out there and actually work in the streets right. in order to talk to the community. That's not her calling. She has things that she's doing. God love her. I wish I could sing even in the sink <laughs> or in the bathroom like that. But I can't, and my kids know that. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, is that we have, we work across the board with influencers and others in order to expand and give storytelling and a narrative to what it is that we need to be doing. So getting back to what it is I do and what we do, the caucus realized that black people are the first and worst impacted when it comes to climate issues. As Felicia was talking about, wh who's dying? Our people, we're the ones dying. Flint, uh, black people who didn't have water. That's why there was no, because it's black people. What's happening in Louisiana, West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Cancer Alley? What do you think is happening? Our people are literally dying because in their backyard are plastics, petrochemical plants. That's where they're put, being put, because you know why? Because the majorities don't want them in their backyard, all right? So the permitting process and the zoning is skewed in order to be in our backyards. So that's why the caucus became so involved in these issues, because we realized that we've got, we can't even vote if we're not alive, right? So we have to be involved in climate environmental justice. But what else are we doing? Why did I also come in? Because we've always been involved in other issues. And so, as many know, engaging in voting rights has always been a passion engaging that, you know, that I've been in, working through the Election Protection Coalition. I see Marcia back there. We've been sisters in arms for years <laughs> on that. But also in climate environmental justice, but also all of our civil and human rights platforms. We have our good trouble. It's called literally good trouble department because we're gonna get in good trouble. That is our educational, criminal justice and policing. That's our platform that engages on LGBTQIA issues, all right? We know what's happening in our schools, why it is that they don't want our kids talking about, they don't want anybody, a little Johnny, learning about race and slavery, that slavery was actually indentured servitude. You know, that this is the rationale because they don't want people to feel guilty. We know what's going on because if you don't know your history, then you're, you're bound to repeat it. We all know this. So that's actually what we're seeing right now. You all, we are going backwards. We are going back to the days. We're already past pre-Brown v. Board of Education. We're back towards going back towards Jim Crow. What else are we working on? We're working on issues of economic justice. I'm so glad that you mentioned this. We have an entire platform. It's called Justice Paid in Full because it's about making sure that we are uplifting the economic of our black community. Bank, black, and green. That is a campaign that we have. Bank, black, and green. Making sure that our black banks yeah are divesting out of mass institutions that are killing our communities, like mass incarceration, prison industry, and then working with the other banks, the majority of banks as well, but also making sure we as people are investing in those issues and in those banks that are supporting our own people. So that's a few of the things that we're engaged in. I won't belabor because I know that, that you know, um, 
hook is coming for me, but what I will say <laughs> is that- A loving hook. Yeah, a loving hook. <laughs> but the Hip Hop Caucus is here. And we, you know, my goal and my purpose is to ensure that you understand all the things that the caucus is involved in. That we are intergenerational, that we are working across generations in order to make sure that our people know what is necessary in order for our survival, in order for us to prosper. Hip hop is naturally disruptive. That's why we're the caucus, okay? The hip, that's how hip hop as a culture was you know, how it became. Because we're talking about what's happening in our communities. And that's what the Hip Hop Caucus does. We hip, you know, we're <laughs> within the communities. We're <laughs> hopping because we're working, we're walking around in our communities, all right? But we're a caucus because we're bringing people together, all right? All right, we're gonna unpack that, I love that. And I'm struck by what you talked about, survival and prosperity. Our community, we talked about that yesterday. Our communities are looking for us to do both. They know we have to survive, but when you talk to folks on the ground, they also want to know how they're going to prosper. How are they going to have generational wealth, right? We're not talking about cribs and having fancy, fancy houses. They just want to be able to buy a house and pass it on to their children, to be able to meet their, their needs and to live, to really enter the middle class and live a safe middle and upper middle class life. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Amara, am I saying it right? Correct me. Amara cannot, Kennedy? Kennedy. Kennedy. National Director of Community Engagement AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Will you tell us about your group and what your priorities are and sort of how are you thinking about it in the context of all of these other issues? We don't have anyone pure, just doing health. We have reproductive health care. But let's talk about AIDS and are you concerned about any rollbacks? given some of the attacks that we're seeing on black communities, on LGBTQIA communities. I know I am. So first of all, I want to uh, just say thank you to Melanie, as we all have, and um, thank you to the coalition. Because yeah. there truly is, as we have seen and we're witnessing and we're living, power in coalition. But I also, my spirit keeps saying that, I just want to share this one thing, because I think yeah. we as black people have got to get out of this terminology. Uh -huh. And I am a firm believer, and I, I want to shout out my colleague with Tanya Thurman, who came in from Ohio to join us, is my parents raised me. I was raised here in, in Southwest Atlanta, not very far from here. My, my mother did 36 years at Spelman. Um, of really being thoughtful around your, your words and your terminology. Mm -hmm. And I, I want us to shift our mentality, I know it's been trained, to referring to ourselves as minority. Mm but to refer to ourselves as African Americans, Black Americans, whatever that identity is for you. Because in order for there to be a minority, there must be a majority. Right. And historically, if we look at the context of that terminology, it is a socialization of that we are less than, and we are not. As a matter of fact, we are kings and queens, and we have come from generation of kings and queens. So I wanted to start there because I think so much of it is when we are subconsciously socializing ourselves and allowing others to socialize us as less than, then we can socialize ourselves sometimes subconsciously that mm -hmm. it is okay for us to receive less than and it's not. We have the strongest buying power of any group in the country. We are the decision makers. So if you think about it, all other cultures and communities they want what we have. They want our hair, they want our culture, they want our style, they want our neighborhoods. They want our hips. <laughs> they want, that's exactly. <laughs> so I just, my, my spirit just said I wanted to start from that point of reference. Yes. <laughs> Secondarily, I, I, I have a, a, a phrase that a dear colleague that some folks in this room know that really is the phrase that I use, which is the yes and. Mm -hmm. It's the yes and, yes and, yes and, we can go down the road and it's the yes and. But what I think is important is that, so yes, so AIDS Healthcare Foundation um, is the world's largest nonprofit public health organization that has a primary focus on addressing HIV and AIDS, both from the awareness and advocacy perspective, but we also um, have directly in service close to two million individuals across right. the globe. Um, and for many, our commitment is to not let financial um, barriers be a barrier to ensuring that all people no matter how you identify, no matter your socioeconomic status, no matter where you come from, any of that, um, do not receive 
the high in quality, quality care that every human being, no matter where they live, deserves. And so that's a deep commitment that we, we take personally and it permeates throughout and to get people in care if they do test positive for HIV or AIDS um, in no less than 70, excuse me, no more than 72 hours from um, the point of their diagnosis. That's so wonderful. that's who we are as one component of the organization. But the other tier of our organization that we're uh, very unapologetically uh, um, out in the front about is that we are a social justice and advocacy organization. So when I say it's the yes and we are in the trenches daily, um, really being in the forefront and working more deeply in coalition, which is why it was so important to, to be more deeply engaged in the, the broader coalition that's being developed. Because one of the things I will say, I think those of us, and, and you know, for those who know me, I, I call myself a reform bureaucrat because I <laughs> worked for many years for many mayors here in Atlanta and, and served under Vice President Gore for a period of time. But what, I, what we have witnessed is that those in the HIV and AIDS service organizations, that we've done somewhat a dis disjustice to community, that because the LGBTQI plus community was so deeply impacted and still is by HIV and AIDS, that much of the communication and the awareness has been focused to that community. So the, the part B of the role that I um, have at HF is overseeing a group called Black, which is the Black Leadership AIDS Crisis Coalition. And really, what we do through Black is to more deeply work with coalitions, work within community around issues and being supportive of issues that impact black people no matter how you show up. And that's why I say it's a yes and so as we talk about that, and I, I can't wait for you to talk to this brother because when I met this brother, I'm not even gonna steal the thunder, the, the way that they are, he is transforming what church looks like and what community and faith looks like is a powerful example of what we all need to be doing you know, in our lives each and every day, not only within our faith communities, but I think the biggest thing is when I think about it is that we have got to move collectively past um, a mentality of segmentation. Now, I'm not talking about don't be all of who you are. I'm not talking about don't bring every aspect of who the richness of who we are to the table. But if you understand the power from a government perspective of segmentation, it's about resources to community. Right. So I always say, with all due respect to, you know, our brothers and sisters of other cultures and communities that really are striving to be our brothers and sisters, that white people don't really spend a lot of time thinking about how to segment black communities. <laughs> they know that if I put the right drop of water to the, ro to the right Negro, that Negro will help segment black communities. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, so. What I want us to really, t and, I, and I appreciate this what- This is the theme of the day, <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, Melanie, look, Melanie will tell you, one of the things <laughs> I, I will say, and I want to, I, I, I really want to do, and I think it's important to give folks our, their flowers now, and I, I, I want to thank my sheroes, um, folks like Helen Butler, th folks like Felicia, folks like Melanie, yes. who have been in the trenches and said, first of all, we cannot just sit behind our desk and think, you know, signing off on these papers and doing these things, you know, that that's gonna make a difference, that we've gotta be in the trenches and we've gotta be in community. But I also will say, and I think some of my brothers and sisters up here will agree, for those of you all that have not turned 50 yet, 50 is some of the freeing times of your life and you really don't give a damn anymore. <laughs> You know, so I'm now 52. Hip hop <laughs> so, is not the only thing turning 50. So all that on to say stage. is, that I, I will just close when I say that I think that that we've got to um, really one understand the power of community, and what has also been shared. My my dear sister, uh, Dr. Bernice <laughs> King, said something one time, and I told her it really resonated with me, is that we have got to stop looking for allies and looking for brothers and sisters. Mm. Because ally says, when it doesn't work for me, I can step away and not be held accountable. Right. But when I'm your brother and sister, I'm in the trenches, I'm in the battlefield, and I got your back even when the stuff don't always look that tight. So what I say is, and to look at allies, thank you, Shabbat, who I love this sister. I've been watching her since she, I was like, go, go, go. Go, go. But, <laughs> but, but allies, I mean, and brothers and sisters, can come in many different colors, can come in many different shapes and sizes, can come in many different political affiliations. Yes. 
So look for our brothers and sisters that want to be in the fight with us and who show up, yes. not just sit back. And I would be remiss, I also, uh, one of the things that we are doing through AHF is, is continuing to build out a coalition. Um, on July 2nd, we are going into the heart of what I call, well, because we are with, with faith leaders, yes. in the heart of the BS that is permeating <laughs> across our country. And on July 2nd, um, a coalition of about 35 or 40 now organizations, both locally based, regionally based, and nationally based, are continuing to come together for what we're calling the We the People March. So we will be in Fort Lauderdale. This is not about Ron DeSantis, so let me be clear about but that. But there is a lot of BS in the FL. There is a lot of BS, and so what sometimes <laughs> you gotta do is you gotta go to the heart of where the sickness yes. is happening and get to the core. And really the essence of the We the People March is all about coalition and saying we as one community, we see you, we watch you, and we will stand up against you for all people. So you can learn more at WTPMarch. Dot, is it org, Tanya? Um, and learn more, and we're here. But I, I just think that collectively. Hopefully we can get that on social. Yes, yes. yes. So collectively, we got to work together as one united force on the yes and. Because any issue that's impacting black people is impacting American people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Reverend Lee, I'm going to have you kind of bring it all home, right? Your minister, I trust you. I know you can do it. Because what we've talked about is that yes and, right? All of these things together, but sometimes there is that Negro in the community dividing us. How do we have the church, our ultimate influencer, bring us all together? So after hearing everybody talk, I feel like saying the doors of the church are open. <laughs> Amen. Is there one? Is there one? I started with Shaman and you ended with you, Alpha and Omega. I understood. <laughs> so, so, so let me say a couple of things. One, um, Tanya, I want to thank you for making me feel real old. Um, <laughs> and, and the reason is because you said the Hip Hop Caucus is about to hit 20. And I was there at the beginning with Lennox um, and Jeff Johnson. And so that f those first campaigns, like, we were all right there. And so um, thank you for making me feel like the old school. God bless you. Um, <laughs> it, it, but I, I, I'm totally excited to see about the evolution of the caucus um, and celebrate you all and all that y'all doing. And just so godly proud um, of what's happening. Now, um, the truth be told, you're talking about how do we bring everybody together, and the church is trying to figure out how to get together. Mm. Mm. Well. <laughs> and so I don't want to come uh, with the audacity of acting as if the church um, has it mm. all together, mm. right? Um, right? But the church is a work in progress, just like all of us are, um, and all of us are trying to get it together. So I, I want to s acknowledge that first, right? Um, I do believe that the church um, can be a great facilitator in a season like this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do believe that the church, um, the, you know, f folks talk about the church being the center of community. I think the challenge, though, is we're living in a decentralized society, mm -hmm. um, a society in which all of our in in institutions are being decentralized. And so uh, folks don't even go to work anymore, right? You stay home. Um, it, like if you look at the major kind of, inst and so even within our civil rights organization, et cetera, they're no longer central. They used to be central for us and no longer, this, and I know you want to feel like you're central, but um, no longer necessarily as central, right? The other thing is that we're dealing in this time in which our institutions are graying. Um, so we're dealing with the graying of the church. Now let me just shake this framework, mm -hmm. and I promise you I'm gonna get to try to deal with what you do. I trust, um, I believe. W without me sounding so pessimistic. Um, we're also dealing with a graying church, right? Mm -hmm. As many of our organizations are graying. Amen, somebody. Amen. Many of our, <laughs> our organizations are graying, if we're honest about it, right? right. Um, and so I think that's important because there are certain things we're expecting of the church that the church may not have the capacity to do in the mm. way it used to do. Yeah. Right. right? It's a whole different thing, right? That that does not mean that faith is not central for people. That does not mean church is not central or can have a central space and role to play, right? It does mean it looks different than what it looked like 40 years ago. 
it, it looks different than what it looked like for your grandmother generation. So right. for, for, for the church to be center of community for grandma and them was a whole different thing because even drug dealers came to church back then and dropped right. off the offering. Yeah. Amen, somebody? <laughs> like everybody went to church back then. Amen? Yeah. Amen. A amen. I, I mean, like straight up and down, everybody, everybody. went to church back then because it was just, uh, it was central to who we were and it was that central space, right? Uh, now, especially in a post-COVID moment um, in which um, even folks who like are very faithful church members are cool at sitting home and watching church in My their underwear. My mom watches three different churches in three right? different time zones. R right, in th <laughs> three different church, three different time zones, right? R right, so it's a yeah. different kind of moment. It's important for us to understand even in our organizing because uh, now is not the season that you can just go to the pastor and believe the pastor is going to be able to get all the people on a Sunday morning to come out to help with your march right. or to come out to help with the get out the vote stuff or the voter registration stuff because the pastor's not seeing everybody on Sunday morning the way they were. Right? The, the pastor, I mean, I mean, the number's coming back from COVID now, but it does mean that you have to understand how the churches are seeing people. Right? So it can't just be that you go by, and you, you know how it used to be that on a certain Sunday morning you would go by the church and give them flyers to hand out to all the members, and you would hand out yes. flyers on the way out of church, right, to kind of get them connected to whatever the organizing was, right? Yeah, now you got to give them a digital package. Right. You got to give them a digital package because two thirds of their members are watching online. And people want to scan it on their phone. Right? <laughs> or or, 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 or want to scan it on the phone. But I'm saying, even past the scan on the phone, you got to give them something to play on the stream. Yeah. yeah. That's because two thirds of the folks is at home yeah. in the kitchen with eggs and grits. <laughs> Whether you put salt or sugar on them, amen. Somebody, I didn't come to. I didn't come to start no drama. We're bringing people here. together, uh, Reverend Lee, not tearing them to, apart. To start no, <laughs> no gang battles in here. <laughs> <laughs> But it's important to understand that reality, right? Because yeah. as we're organizing, it means we have to organize differently. The second thing is that we have to also understand, though, that we're dealing with, because of the grain of the church, the folks who really understood the science behind the get out the vote and the voter registry and all that kind of stuff, that those folks don't have the energy they used to have to do what they used to do. And so at the time that you had a, 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 a deaconess such and such who you just get word to her and she would organize the people and she knew how to get you to, she knew how to get you to polling folks for the polls, knew how to get you to, the, the, those folks don't know the science of it anymore. And so therefore there's a need for a whole re-education of the church to help them. I, I, I'm excited to also work with the Black Church Pack, and the Black Church Pack right. has been very helpful um, in assisting churches build capacity around these kinds of things, right? Shaping um, in the 2020 elections, the Black Church Pack um, impacted um, 1.2 million people through textathons, right? That was getting churches, connecting them to the technology so that they could be able to broker their people so that people could work from their own phones right where they were to be able to engage in these textathons to be able to impact possible voters and voter registration and blah, 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 blah. Is that making sense, right? Totally makes sense. Right, so there's a whole different way we've got to do it. So if we're going to talk about how to, like, if we got all these false actors, right? One, we got to deal with the fact that we have to be real about what we have in the church. Right now, I believe though that the church can still be a significant, impactful place for justice, but I believe it has to do it for us all. That we can't leave anybody on the outside, and we can do that even if our theology, even if we have theological differences, right? Yes, that's right. We can have theological differences, and everybody still be at the table. Right? Yes, yes. I can differ with you in opinion, but we still all eat together, right? And the fact of the matter is we all catching the same hell out here in this nation. And so we don't have the luxury of allow of weaponizing our theology to keep anybody on the outside of the fight together. We need everybody for this fight. Does that make everybody. sense to somebody? And, and, and so for me, it, it is about us understanding that we are better together. And if we come together with God on our side, we can transform this nation. Yes. Right. Because this nation needs a revival. Amen. This nation needs, it's, it's just Pentecost Sunday. This nation needs some Holy Ghost power. Amen, somebody? Lord, send a revival. 
revival. It, 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 in order to cast out these demons in this nation, and these <laughs> demons of white supremacy, and these demons uh, uh, that, that, that cause the social inequities, and, and, and these policy demons uh, 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 of, of some of these daggone politicians, we need the Holy Ghost. And we need leaders who can be able to, we, we need transformative leaders who can be able to talk about public policy, go into a community and say this community can be healed, and then see somebody sick and go grab them by the hand and pray over them and they get healed right there. You, you see what I'm saying? We need folks that can say, no, healing can happen, but healing can happen for your family. Healing can happen. We can help get your child off of drugs. We can get your child about the crew. We can transform our community and all this violence is happening, no, we can shape programming and go into community and be with the shooters and cause the shooters to be transformative agents. That we can do that, but we've got to understand we can only do that together. 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 Woo! <laughs> Friends, we're gonna wrap up with one more rapid round, and I'm gonna start with Felicia. Can you tell, this is a very educated, very engaged audience, but we gotta leave people with one action item. What's the one thing and I'm only giving you 20 seconds to say it. I'm not gonna say one word, which you did to me on the panel once. <laughs> she said okay. one word. Okay. My, my what, do, one, what do you need people to do? My one thing is for black people to realize that we're African people. And so as African people, we're a global majority. And if we have our young people connect with our people around the globe, this century belongs to some other folks. The next century is ours. It belongs to Africa and African people. So whether it be design and a keep, keep, a, keep a look at it. Doesn't matter where you go, high and low, Africa is rising. The US population 2050 will grow 2%. Africa, the only continent, not country, 99%. And right now there are a half billion African young people under 20. So just process. All right, Victoria, I'm gonna jump to you and then you get my, how it's going, so you all know who to be prepared for. Victoria, what are you leaving people with? What do you need them to do? One thing. One thing, come together. The end of the, not the end of the story, but a big part of the story in North Carolina, I'm keep it brief, um, is that after HB2 passed, black folks, people of faith, uh, Bishop Barber, and the, the state NAACP, LGBTQ groups in the state came together. And for the first time in North Carolina's history, a sitting governor did not get reelected. Mm -hmm. First time in North Carolina's history, 200 plus years. Mm -hmm. When we come together, there is nothing we can't accomplish. So again, break down those silos. Amara. To remember that uh, we are one community, there is power in one. To remember the power of intergenerational awareness and staying woke. And that staying woke doesn't happen in only in November, but staying woke <laughs> needs to happen 365 every year. And to not assume that your mama, your daddy, your cousin, your neighbor, your church member is registered to vote and is going to vote and is educated on who to vote for. And last is to remember our election cycle, this is not a popularity contest. Mm -mm. This is a livelihood contest. And to make sure that we are voting and educating others in our community around voting for those individuals that speak up for all issues that are important to us and then the day that we go vote, hold them accountable the other 364 days. All right, Sheena. Um, I'll build off of what you shared, community. When we come together in numbers, and if you just keep in mind that map, the same folks that are attacking every issue on this stage is also attacking um, reproductive health. Yes. Um, and so I want to leave you with, let's come together as a community. Right. Reverend Lee. I, I, I would say that it's important for us to come together as community, but don't expect us to come together as community if you can't speak to the person at your table. Mm. We cannot get so focused on the macro, we forget the micro, right? Um, that we can't think that we're gonna do all this kind of uh, collaborative work organizationally and we hating on each other. 
and we're gossiping about each other, and we mean to each other in personal conversation. But we have to let our personal ethic be one that connects to our corporate ethic. And if we allow our personal ethic connect to our, because the, you're not gonna organize people if you can't be in relationship with people. That's right. Mr. Stan, Mr. Stan. And then Tanya, I'm coming to you and we're gonna end up with Reverend Siobhan. <laughs> oh, we, I got you girl, <laughs> Mr. Stan. So I think, I think you kind of heard from all of my colleagues up here uh, just really uh, how we have to uh, co be in collaboration and be consistent. I mean, we've got to be in there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. uh, my good friend and mentor, John Lewis, uh, you guys have all heard him say about keeping his eyes on the prize, and we have to continue to do that. Um, being here on Clark ca campus is, is very, very, uh, really an example of that, of, of really hanging there and being consistent. Yes. Uh, in the mid-'80s, as a young police officer in Atlanta, I was patrolling on Walnut Street and saw this young lady in some black shorts and a red tank top riding a bicycle, none other than Melanie Campbell. <laughs> and I tell you, I, uh, uh -oh. I, 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 was, I was patrolling and uh, I tell you, uh, we talk about us being friends and long standing. Uh, I ran up on the curb, wrecked my patrol car <laughs> and we have been, <laughs> We have been consistent. Is this being live broadcast? <laughs> I'm giving an example of consistency, people. We have been consistently <laughs> in this struggle, cycling, patrolling, and wrecking for change ever since. And we have got to continue to stay together and be in there for the long haul. We need more stories. <laughs> Tanya, <laughs> Tanya, and then Siobhan. <laughs> that, that was a good one. I, I need more stories like that. I know, um, that should have been your opening. <laughs> we, I, I know that we all have some. We won't all share them right now. Uh, <laughs> one thing to leave you all with. So we've heard this need to collaborate. There are, you know, wordsmithing you can do. Collaborate, coordinate. We need to get out of our silos. Um, I will say there is the power in understanding the intersectionality of all of our issues. Amen. And, but what I think I really want to leave you with, with all of that, so plus one to everything that everyone has said. <laughs> yes, and. <laughs> but, yes, and, is that this was a conversation that actually I was engaged in yesterday, last night, was that we as a people, sometimes think, like you said, we hate on each other. We think that um, if you're, you need to be in the streets, but not in the suites. Right. Because if, in your, if you're in the suites, yeah. then you're a sellout. Mm, yeah. That it yeah. only works if you're out there marching. But if you're out there marching and you don't know what the heck you're doing and marching for and how to get things passed, then why are you marching? Right. Yeah. So my point is this. We need to come together and get out of our silos and get out of our heads. I want to say something else, but there's too many ministers on. <laughs> um, and say that we need to be both in the streets and in the, street, yeah. in the suites, yeah. okay? Because we need to be the power brokers for ourselves. We know what's impacting our communities, so I need us to support each other in where we are. Everybody has a purpose. Not everybody's purpose is to be out there marching. Other people's purpose is to be out maybe in the administration, maybe working in other communities, uh, working for a governor, working for elected officials, working in Congress. I've done all of those in different ways, but I've also figured out right now my purpose is this, is to bring all of that to bear. And so support one another and how it is that they're engaging so that we can uplift our entire community and not hate on one another so that we can't move forward. And let me tell you what, as Siobhan prepares to provide our panel benediction, the next time we're gonna have a panel on fund funding from our philanthropic partners, because Tanya's done that work and so have I, and we need to figure out how they're funding us. Next panel's on that. That's good. So, Reverend Siobhan, take us out. So I think the conversation has been so rich, but I, I wanna say this. We are not a monolith. Mm -mm. 
And the danger that I see amongst black organizers is this desire to have to be on the same page. Right. When in actuality, black people have always had different approaches to experience. But not being a monolith does not make us less powerful. So if we operate in our issues and know what they are and know how to push them, it all leads back to one thing, power. Mm. Who has power? Who doesn't have power? And I, I would caution us to not be afraid of black power. Mm. Let me tell you what black power is. Black power means that there is no, no enemy, no distraction to understanding how black people advance. No, no white supremacist move can stand in the way of me understanding how I get to achieving what is best for blackness. My context every single day is what is best for being black right now in America. My child is a nine-year-old third grader mm. who had to get help to get into a class because his mom was real intense about his education. But what he is is a black boy in a school that didn't see him as worthy. Right. And my intentionality around blackness is really for every black organization in this room. If you're a black person, you're on my team. If you're a black woman, you're on my team. If you're a black brother, you're on my team. If you're a black preacher, a black trans woman, a black per if you're a black human, you're on my team. Mm. Yeah. And what we have gotten out of is understanding this context for humanity. Yeah. And I'm a preacher, so my context is also about how Jesus dealt with this. This is why he threw the tables over in the temple. Yes. Because he saw foolishness happening when people's lives were at stake. But the temple was caught up in the materialistic side of the work. That does not mean don't be prosperous. I like what I like. And I'm fine with that. Because I believe that God gave me gifts to earn what I earn. But I will tell you this. I came from the streets and the suites. And I understand that all of it has a place and purpose in life. But what we have gotten out of is understanding the beauty of the united shade of black. Mm. The United Shade of Black really says that there is a place at this table for you. And even if we don't agree, I got a lot of preachers that don't agree with me when I talk about being pro-choice. And I'm also a woman in the pulpit. Yeah. But I tell them this, you can't stop my anointing, you can't stop my assignment, you can't stop my calling. And that's my charge to us. They can't stop our anointing, they can't stop our assignment, yeah. they can't stop black united fronts. And if we get ourselves to the place, well, I don't see you as other. I said it. Mm -hmm. That I don't see my own as other. Right. If you start seeing me as just a Delta, come on, the inside joke, that's the AK, whatever. <laughs> they ain't gonna ask you about you being pink or green. They gonna say, are you black or not? Right. Amen. right. So my question is, brother and sister that is at this table, who have you created an alignment front for? Yeah. And are you ashamed and hiding from blackness? Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. Because my blackness gives me power. Yeah. My blackness is my context. And it does not even exclude brown or red or any other color there is. It is saying that I have clear consciousness of who I am. Yeah. And guess what? When it's good for me, it's going to be good, good for everybody. everybody. <laughs> in the United States of America, the conversation around being black in this country has been around value. Who have they valued? Where have they given resources to? And I tell you, once black people come up, the whole country comes up. Amen. Right. Because we then begin to look at systems change in a different way. So don't be afraid of being black today. Don't hide from blackness today. Love on it, live in it, but fight until the death for it. All right now. Woo! Thank you all for coming. We're moving on to our next event. But power of the ballot, power to the people, and power to the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation. Thank you all to our panelists. Push your chairs to the table, stand behind you, too. Oh, okay. Put the water on the chair. Put the water on the chair. All right, family, was that amazing or what? And you know what else is amazing? We're going to take a short break and then we're going to hear from the amazing Dr. Bernice King. So here we go. And is there more? 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 Oh, there's a, oh, you know, black people got to take pictures. We're going to do that too. There we go. I said I love you black. I love the color of my skin. I love the skin that I made. I said I'm black and black. Black and black. 
Are we live? Are we live in here? No, no, no. Are we live in here? Are we live out there? All right. All right. How you doing? Woo, can we give our uh, last uh, uh, leaders, organizers, extraordinaire uh, for our Power of the Ballot session another round of applause and our facilitator, our lead discussants. And it is my true pleasure and joy to bring on, uh, to share her love, her, her spiritual guidance, her movement spirit, her leadership, her thought leadership uh, to the stage to share with us uh, some of the things that I think we, that fit uh, what we're doing here today around what she has uh, coined the beloved community. Say beloved community. And it is Reverend Dr. Bernice A. King. Can we stand up for my sister? Give her some, some yes, yeah, some black love, black joy, black love. She is the CEO of the King Center. She is a global thought leader, strategist, solutionist, orator, peace advocate. And again, she is the CEO. And more importantly, she's a sister who loves deeply. And I love her. Um, we were, um, I'm a little bit older, about a couple of years, right? But uh, I went to her party recently. It was, uh, it was such a, um, Amara was there. I flew down. I was so glad I did, man. And we had a good time. And she celebrated her 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 milestone birthday, 60. I wasn't gonna say unless you said 60, and that means I'm older than her. If anybody didn't know, now you know. Uh, and she just brought uh, folks together, and we had a great and wonderful time. And I know she's got a crazy schedule, but she was not gonna miss being here uh, for this uh, power convening. So. Give it up for my sister, Reverend Dr. Bernice King. Well, good uh, afternoon, everybody. I think it's almost, is it afternoon yet? Yeah. It's still morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A <laughs> uh, good morning after. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, look, let me uh, just first uh, really thank uh, Melanie Campbell. We go 
a long way back um, in, in movement work and activism uh, when we were just in college, young folks trying to make a difference. Um, and I just appreciate your heart and your passion um, for the work, but more importantly for galvanizing and organizing people uh, who may not always want to be together. Uh, but the reality is that in order to effectively advance justice and equity um, in this world and ultimately create the beloved community, we got to figure out how to, to work together. And, and when my father wrote his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos of Community, one of the things he challenged us to, and this was in 1967, he challenged us a lot around organizing because he foresaw as a prophet uh, the kinds of things we, we would be faced with, uh, the monumental giants that would resist uh, true uh, equality. And, and so he talked about a nettlesome task. That means it's irksome, it's bothersome, it, it can be very involved. And I know in this quick fix society, we don't like that because we want things to hurry up and happen, you know, real quick. But he said the nettlesome task is to organize our strength into compelling power. Um, so that at that time, he said, so that the government cannot elude our demands. Um, and he wasn't just spitting some words, writing some words, elucidating, he was, giving us a charge for the continuation of movement past a civil rights act, you know, to a global world society where people truly honor, respect the dignity and the value of every human being. And I know this part is hard, which is including those who are our adversaries and may, and we may see as our enemies, those who have created in, in just, unjust circumstances. And so I want to thank uh, Melanie for bringing this, this, this gathering together. And I want to just honor, too, my good friend, um, Tommy Dortch, a great leader who was always uh, about preparing um, and give an opportunity to the next generation of civic and business leaders. So let's just give it up for Thomas Dortch and this wonderful institute and the merging of the, the work that um, Melanie has been doing and will, will continue to do. So thank you all for, for being here. Um, you know, when I was thinking about what I will briefly say, um, I said, you know, she gave me a real hard assignment because when, and if I might be frank, when, when you look at the state of things and, and what just happened uh, yesterday in the, the city of Atlanta uh, with the, the raid uh, of that home, um, it's hard to talk about the beloved community. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's be real. Who wants to hear about the word love uh, in, in a climate where there's a lot of hate and polarization and, and divisiveness. Uh, in fact, uh, all of the trauma that has come from generations, centuries of oppression and repression and depression and exploitation um, and, and killing and maiming and, and, and um, lynching um, and separating and dividing and diminishing um, has, has been difficult. And it creates um, a lot of pain and hurt and borders on a lot of bitterness. And so when Dr. King came along, he understood that because he grew up in those same set of circumstances, although he was from a middle class family and uh, ended up being highly educated, he still was a black man in America. 
where conditions did not, and circumstances and laws did not respect his personhood as a man in America. Um, and, and so he wrestled with that a lot. He even flirted with hating all white people as a result of it. Um, and I'm just laying this foundation because sometimes when we think about Dr. King, we, we idealize him as this person who just was perfect um, and, and didn't struggle with things and question things and agonize over, over these difficult things. So he had those kind of emotions inside of him, you know, but he found a mechanism, he found a philosophy to plant himself in um, that he felt could help to re-engage what was happening in our nation and ultimately our world and inspire people to use all of that energy of pain and, and emotion and to channel it into a vehicle that could bring about lasting and sustainable change. And so when they were in Montgomery, as they started, in, in the early days, um, when he was articulating to the people who were frustrated and who were tired of the mistreatment and, and the lack of dignity, um, and, and, and what just happened, of course, with Emmett Till, um, he challenged that group to really steep themselves. At that time, it was called in Christian love, which later began to be interpreted in this philosophy and methodology of nonviolence, so love in action. And so when they were engaged in that struggle for dignity, and I want to put that word out there because it really is at the end of the day when we're talking about the work of justice, it's the, it's the work of really advancing dignity in uh, the world. And, and, and so when he challenged people, he wanted them to not focus just on what was bad and hurtful and harmful. He wanted to give them an ultimate vision to go after. So as I stand here today, I, I want to put this out there because I think it's important as a preacher, there's a, there's a scripture that all of you all are familiar with. You've heard it even if you're not a Christian. And it is, without a vision, the people perish. One, one translation says they cast off restraint. They go buck wild, in other words. There's, there's nothing there to hold them together in a cohesive way. You know, when you don't have that kind of vision, people just come to the party. They come to the situation with their own thoughts and, and ideas um, about uh, how to do it and how to, how to get there. But uh, an ultimate vision and an ultimate goal was what he rallied people around. And for him, that goal was about reconciliation and redemption and the creation of the beloved community. And the way you get there is on this pathway that he called nonviolence, which is difficult to talk about today. When people are hurling hate at you, when they're being violent towards you, how do you have the strength and the courage and the tenacity and the faith, you know, and the gall to operate from this place that is more powerful than anything that I've ever witnessed, heard about, or seen. Because what he helped people to understand in that time is that violence doesn't solve anything. It creates more difficult problems. It alienates. It estranges. And the argument was made, well, you know, at least it gets some people's attention, but, but I always raise the question, what kind of attention? So he was galvanizing people around this ultimate vision that was even beyond the people that he was galvanizing. Because he, he understood that every human life was created in the image and after the likeness of God. We call it the Imago Dei. And that every human life deserves dignity.
And so when you think about a beloved community, if I had to sum it up, I, I, I'm going to read my, my mother's explanation because we talk about daddy a lot. <laughs> I, I like to lift up my, my mom because uh, if the truth be told, The reason we talk about Martin today the way we do is because Coretta Scott King. Um, and days and years to come, we'll, we'll know more about that as we process through her papers and start making things available to the public. Um, but she talked about it being realistic. Now, if you're sitting out there right now, most people think when they hear the word beloved, it's a buzzword. We use it in Atlanta, we, we misuse it. This ain't no beloved community city. Let's just be real. We don't operate in the spirit of the beloved community. We don't make decisions out of the spirit and the heart of the beloved community. We don't think about the dignity of people when we make these decisions. And that's gotta change uh, in our city got to change across the nation. But she said the beloved community is a realistic vision. It's not this utopia that people think, oh, y'all talking about a beloved community, that's unrealistic, y you know. But you know why that is? Because most people think the beloved community is about going along to get along, or about everybody liking each other, or thinking alike. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's an achievable society. One Problems, this is key, problems and conflicts exist. See, some people think in the beloved community, as long as things are peaceful and quiet, that's the beloved community. As long as you got people together, they just kind of quietly getting along they're in the same room, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of stuff underneath the surface. Come on now. Let's be honest. Um, so problems and conflicts exist, but, but, but they are resolved using this m philosophy and methodology of nonviolence and doing it without that bitterness. In the beloved community, this is Ms. Coretta Scott King, caring and compassion drive political policies that support the worldwide elimination of poverty, hunger, and all forms of bigotry and violence. The beloved community is a state of heart and mind, a spirit of hope and goodwill that transcends all boundaries and barriers and embraces all creation. That, that's in those who are adversaries. So you can't, the beloved community is not about counseling people. It's about being a vessel so that those people can be converted. Oh, y'all not talking to me. I'm not saying everybody's going to convert. That's why in the beloved community, you always work towards conditions and circumstances where there are laws in place so that people can be held accountable. So it's not excusing behavior, but it's creating a culture and an environment uh, where, where justice and equity uh, can, can be realized by all people, where, where people in fact can live up to their potential where they can thrive, in other words. And so, at its core, the beloved community is an engine of reconciliation. And she went on to say, this seems, this way of living seems a long way from the kind of world we have now, but I do believe it's a goal that can be accomplished through courage and determination and through education and training, if enough people are willing to make the necessary commitment. And for my father, of course, you know, that he talked about it being achieved through a critical mass of people committed to and trained in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. And that's what they did in that movement. They educated and they trained people in the way to create, ultimately, a community of dignity where your value is honored, where circumstances and conditions are created for you to thrive. And so when we're doing this work of justice, 
we have to always keep this in mind because at the core of the beloved Christian, that word is in there, is love. And love is a difficult word because we think it's a feeling. And it's not a feeling. It really is about understanding goodwill toward all humankind. It's a force. It's a power that it can unearth ugly. It can expose injustice and wrongdoing. Love can cause the conscience to be pricked. Again, it's realistic in the sense that we're not talking about whether every single solitary person converts, but we're t talking about creating um, an environment and creating spaces and places where people can thrive because there's this critical mass of people that are committed to ensuring that certain things don't prevail in that environment. It doesn't mean they may not try to creep in, but they can't prevail. You know, that's why at the King Center we have envisioned the beloved community as a society where injustice ceases and love prevails. But it takes a commitment on each one of our parts to do that and to understand the ultimate goal is about creative energy. That's what love does. It, it creates the possibility of other things to grow and thrive. The problem with the opposite uh, of, of what creates the beloved community, which is violence usually, is that it's destructive. And when stuff is destructive, nothing can grow, nothing can thrive. And so that's why you approach it by understanding that when I'm doing the work of justice, I'm doing it from a, a space of, of love and creative energy, but not the weak, sentimental type of love. I'm talking about the powerful love, the love that Daddy talked about being meshed with power to realize justice. When he said power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is love or power correcting everything that stands against love. And so in the beloved community, you spend your energy creating an environment where people can uh, thrive and where the, the, the dignity of the individual is honored and, and, and respected um, and you correct those things that stand against those possibilities. So doing justice is when we use the power of love to correct systems and ideologies and uh, conditions that stand against that love, against the dignity, and the worth, and the value of individuals. So you have to be a vessel then that is focused on not destroying anything in the process. And that's hard. That's where the hard part comes in. When we tell people in, in nonviolence the principle, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people, that's hard for people because the people are doing the injustice. And so we're saying, uh-uh, we need to destroy that person because we believe that if we destroy that person, maybe not physically, but if we destroy them with our tongues, then we can get to that ultimate goal and, to, and we can get to justice. But all that does is set us up for continual brass tactics because the violence is a descending spiral. And violence is not just physical. Violence is verbal, it's your thinking. In fact, we define nonviolence as a, a love-centered way of thinking, speaking, acting, and engaging that leads to personal, cultural, and societal transformation. And so when the bus protest was taking place, Dr. King had to remind everybody, look, our goal is the beloved community. And in the beloved community, 
Justice is a reality. Equity is a reality. Dignity is at the center of it. Reconciliation is an engine. And so we can't try to defeat the white folks in the context of the movement. We got to try to figure out how to not win over them, but how to win them over. So we have to create an environment and a space for that to happen. And that's why when the, when the, 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 um, the boycott ended and I struggled because he stopped calling it a boycott and calling it a protest, which is a whole nother discussion that I don't want to go off into. Uh, but, but, the, but the essence of it is, for him, because of the way boycotts were being used in that time with some of the, 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 the white racist groups, um, he didn't want that to be confused with what they were trying to do. They were not trying to destroy. They were trying to create something. And what they were trying to create was a, was a, was a society and a community that had dignity and respect for the black community. And so when, when it was over, he cautioned our, our, our brothers and sisters. He cautioned them to not see this as a victory over white people. And that's what we have to be careful of when we're doing the work of justice, because sometimes we couch it in terms of trying to defeat somebody. That's not what we're supposed to do in the work of justice. The work of justice needs a context from which to operate so that you can, can continue to expand the community and grow the community and create those seeds of possibility so that others in future generations can thrive. Because if you allow some of the violence and, and, the, and the mean spiritedness that you are experience, experiencing to enter in, then the future generations will be the recipient of that. And so we have to break that violence. It's like fire. If you're a fireman, you don't go to the home or the, the facility and take fire with you. Because all you'll do is cause it to spread and cause more damage and, and more harm and, and more destruction. You have to take another kind of substance. And that's what love is. It's a different substance than hate. It's, it's, a, it's a different stuff, substance than bitterness and, and meanness. Love conquers a lot of stuff. But it has to be practiced on a daily and a day-by-day -day basis. And it's not weak. It does not take injustice, but it also does not hurl out injustice. So you can't get to justice through unjust means. The means and the ends have to be consistent. You can't get to a beloved community through hateful, bitter, and a sense of defeat. Hope has to be your energy and love and truth, which we don't talk enough about. And so I just wanted to lead this little bit. It's a lot <laughs> uh, to talk about with you, because as you work together, understand that the beloved community exists wherever you bring the spirit and the heart of what it means to create dignity, worth, and value, and understand that we have a connectedness that none of you can do anything about. Good luck. Maybe years ago before we invented the plane, you know, and automobiles where you could exist in your little silo on your farm far away, maybe so. But unfortunately, we are all interconnected. You're holding devices to prove that. The device in your hand was created by people you don't even know, most of whom do not look like you, don't live in the same nation and a part of the same culture that you are part of. You don't even know if, what those people think about you. Just that little device alone. So every day, as you do this work, realize there's this interconnectedness. We are a family in here and beyond here. And families do fight. Y'all read about us in the news. OK, let's just be honest. But what I can tell you is that we all love each other. 
we don't agree with each other and sometimes vehemently disagree and may stand in different places concerning things. But at the end of the day, if somebody were to charge one of my brothers in spite of our differences, then you're going to have to see me. So beloved community is a broad complex con uh, uh, um, concept. It can seem like it's impossible. It can seem unrealistic. You can dismiss it. But what I'm finding out every day, over and over again, is that the universe, which is on the side of justice, righteousness, truth, we can call the list. Also mercy, forgiveness, dignity, compassion. That universe is trying to teach us something every day. And no matter how far off we get, and no matter how painful and harmful things are, the universe is teaching us about who we are as humanity. And so the things that occur don't always think they are occurring for certain reasons that you might think cynically. They're also occurring because there's a master plan being worked out. And I'm going to say something that probably only I can say. <laughs> well, a few other people could say it. But in this room, probably one of a few, if, if only person that can say it. Everything that we're going through right now, as unfortunate as it is, one, my mother told us, struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. Well, that seems unfair, Bernice. Well, it also seems unfair that we can have a generation that's exempt from a freedom struggle. So every generation had to fight for another generation, and you can just come on the scene and just live your best life and not put in something. Mm -mm. You got to make a contribution, too. There's a master plan. And until the final unveiling comes, whatever that may be, for some, for me, to the kingdom of God is fully ushered in, then that's a reality. Some things you have to accept in this life. I figured that out after 60 years. Like you gotta accept, um, um, what is it called, um, gravity. You know, yeah, you can create the airplane, the fly, and all that kind of stuff, but there's certain realities about gravity you can't get around. If you just go jump off a certain height building, you might as well just say, bye. <laughs> you got to accept that this is a part in the essence of humanity because there are things being worked out. And it's also calling for us to stay engaged. The reason we're experiencing what we're experiencing today is because we lost years of engagement. Too much apathy. Too much, you know, I got mine over here, I'm enjoying it. And so some things have occurred because we had to be awakened to realize that we always have to be vigilant. That's why Daddy warned us also, he said that one of the tragedies of human history, still, that's what he says, still. And I'm saying, still, <laughs> 55 years after his death, assassination, not death, assassination, is that the children of darkness are often more zealous and determined than the children of light. Darkness sets aside those differences. And they go to work together strategically and coordinatedly, if that's a word. And they do their work. But light kind of, you know, takes days off, 
you know, chills, fuss, fight, whatever. You do what you do, I'm gonna do what I do. Uh-uh. We gotta stay connected, engaged, coordinated. That's why this is important, and that's why today is not enough. This is ongoing work. Now, you as a person, if you gotta take a vacation, please, because self-care is important. But the process and the critical mass can't stop. And finally, this is the thing that I was going to say. You know, the price that we have to pay in the work of justice is an honorable price. It might not seem fair. It may seem unfortunate to you, but it's bigger than you. It starts with us, but it ain't about us. And so, back in 2018, somebody asked me about, you know, the whole assassination piece and my feelings, and, you know, I said to them, guess what? As much as I would have liked to have had my dad here, to enjoy those years with him. The times when I was growing up, you know, those daddy-daughter dances, you know, the opportunity to have him scare off some of my boyfriends. <laughs> the years that I could have had just picking his brain as I developed in ministry and the questions that I need to ask. At the end of the day, if I had to do it all over again, I would take nothing away from what became of my life and my family's life. I would take nothing away because I can't imagine a world without what Dr. King did and the price he had to pay. Couldn't have because there's a greater purpose we in this room have a greater purpose. So we got to put down our swords internally. We got to pick up our shields together. And then we got to go to battle and not have self-inflicted wounds in the process. That means we got to start within and make sure within us we have the right heart and the spirit toward each other. Because that's what the beloved community is about. Having the right heart and spirit toward each other. And realize that the enemy, although it's dressed in certain clothes, suits, and whatever else, but the enemy is injustice. The enemy is evil. The enemy is inequity. The enemy is in bad policy, but we have the capacity together, united, with an ultimate goal in mind to realize a beloved community where those policies and those injustices can be corrected with the power and strength and the courage and the truth of love. God bless you. you up because we want to just say thank you <laughs> thank you my sister I'm ready I'm, you got to work on me though because you know I come from men's fall you know with everybody care care carrying <laughs> carrying carrying but we are there and I'm so blessed that I was able to be t to come under the King Center when I was a student and how you, we would talk about how she, birdies, we would have those student conferences and how I learned about King and nonviolence uh, and being able to understand, but not just the words, but they take us to Selma. And if you ain't been to Selma, you gotta go. So you can really get it. Selma, right, right, Montgomery, go through 
the movement is many, many places. It's, it, and, and so I, I cut my teeth here and at King Center and FCLC and black politics and all of that. So I just wanted to just say thank you and we love you. And Dr. French is here, I want to make sure he eat. Thank you, thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you so much, Dr. King, for the words. And I, and I came in at near the end, but was so impactful. Thank you for sharing with your university. This is, I, I know you're not a <laughs> clock, but this is still the whole center is your institution. Spell, she, spell. Said, she, she said Spelman. Spell, 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 spell. Number one HBCU. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey. no rivalry, because I love no Clark rivalry. AU. <laughs> That's right. We are together, and thank you so much for coming to share with us. Terry, so good to see you on this Howard ground, and we look forward to continue today. Please stand, let's give her, stand up and give my sister another round of love. Um, uh, what we're going to, to, real love, come on, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Um, we're going to uh, go offline for, uh, for lunch. Uh, for the folks who are dealing with the online, Getcho, I think we're opening up the, uh, and, and we have lunches on the other side of that wall. Um, Makati's going to give, uh, for those who are the facilitators uh, and lead facilitators, get ready to let you know what, how we're going to shift uh, the time. All right, family, if you are a facilitator for a state table, could you just come? Come see me. <laughs> come see me as we're as we're transitioning to lunch. Yeah, come on. Yes, ma'am. If you are a state facilitator, if you can come over and see me.
Co colleagues, lunch is served. Please pick up your food. Lunch is served. Please pick up your lunch. <laughs>
we offline. Are we offline? We offline, right? Okay, okay. How's everybody doing? How's everybody? Um, we're going to uh, ask that everyone get your food.
Hi, everybody. Are we live in here? <laughs> Are we live out there? So we're live in here, and we're live out there. I'm Melanie Campbell, President and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, convener of the Black Women's Roundtable, co-founder of the NCBCP Thomas W. Dorsch Jr. Institute for Leadership Development, Civic Engagement, Economic Empowerment, and Social Justice. And so for those of you all who are watching, we thank you for uh, either been watching us for the last day and a half or just tuning in. Thank you, Roland Martin Unfiltered, for helping us get this conversation and this conversation out of the room. So thank Roland Martin for me, please. So it is my honor and ple uh, pleasure and privilege to turn the convening over to our host, uh, Dr. George French Jr. Can you give him a hand? President of Clark Atlanta University and also co-founder of the Thomas W. Dorsch Jr. Institute. And we thank you, Dr. French, for just so much. I'll go all over it again and start crying but just for being able to help us see a bigger, even bigger vision when Tommy uh, George was with us. And, and that, i never forget that meeting we had in your office. Right. And you said, we can do much more. And we, let's think big. And we did. And I thank you and from the bottom of my heart. I'm going to turn this over to you because there's this awesome fireside chat we're getting ready to have. And so I'm going to get out of the way of that and have you introduce our powerful brother in the movement leader as, in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give Melanie a round of applause to her board, to all of these board members, participants. We again welcome you to the beautiful campus of Clark Atlanta University. We're going to have a, a conversation uh, picking up on some of the issues that Dr. King raised earlier. And we're privileged to have with us the distinguished uh, CEO of the United Negro College Fund, Michael Lomax, an individual that this community knows well. He's been a leader in this community for decades, county commission and otherwise. He's led the, UN, the um, College Fund to unprecedented heights in fundraising, in advocacy, and other areas. And we're going to ask him <coughs> to speak to us uh, today on, and we have um, Getcho presented us uh, about three questions that, that would kind of contextualize our conversation. And where we are now, as far as the topic, Melanie, the attack on black history in public education, the power of HBCUs in achieving higher educational attainment, advancement, economic, political, and social justice for black America. That's what we are going to discuss today. And the, the attack on black history and public education piece, as we well know, is what's really hot. Uh, this is um, the conversation about intersectionality right now, critical race theory. We know what's going on in Atlanta, I mean in um, Florida, where the governor uh, basically is assuring that DEI and critical race and intersectionality, none of those are, are taught in the public schools in Florida. Even the 28 presidents of the state colleges recently met to indicate their support for DeSantis and making sure that intersectionality and critical race theory is not discussed. But what we are discussing today is systemic racism. Now, somebody tell me, how can anyone deny systemic racism when you look at those many years that we were enslaved, when you look at Jim Crow, when you look at the Civil Rights Movement, Black Lives Matter, and then let's go all the way back to 1884, November 1884, the Berlin Conference, where it was systematically decided that Europeans were going to divide Africa legally and take what they wanted. And they've done that since then. And now we have the same level of fight in the United States. So we're going to ask Dr. Lomax um, to speak to um, any of these issues that have been raised, but I'll frame it with a question. 
Most HBCUs, Dr. Lomax, first, won't you greet us? And then I ask the question. Thank you. I was hoping you would do that because <laughs> I, I did want to, first of all, I want to say uh, to uh, Melanie Campbell how delighted we are to have her back home yes. in Atlanta, Georgia, yes. at Clark Atlanta University, and to have her leading the charge, both uh, obviously with the National Council on Black Civic Engagement, but in partnership now and in the in residence at the Thomas W. Dorch Jr. Institute here at Clark Atlanta University. Uh, your leadership, your powerful presence here in Atlanta will make uh, a, a real difference in terms of keeping these important issues that uh, leadership, civic engagement, economic empowerment, and social justice um, all combine. And, uh, you know, and they, they bring so many other issues. I, I know we've got people here on sustainability and the environment and making sure that we're good stewards of the earth. So there's, this is a, this is a homecoming, and we're deli I'm delighted to be part of. I'm not, you know, I'm not officially, but you know, I'm still welcoming you. I'm back, back. I, if I was on, still on the Fulton County Commission, I'd be giving you an honorary citizenship. I'd, I'd be giving you a tax bill, and I'd be saying, uh, just come on home. But I don't do that anymore. But I still feel like uh, it's always a good thing when you're down south to say welcome, and we welcome you. And well, we also say welcome to Dr. French, you know. Uh, he's, he's kind of a newcomer here to Atlanta. Now, those of us who have had the opportunity to work with him during his decades in uh, Birmingham, Jefferson County, Alabama, know of the great work that he's done uh, in Alabama at Miles College. And let's give him a hand. Come on now. And you know, and and Atlanta is a movement city, but you know, you don't get much more movement city than than Birmingham. And and you know, this this we on stu we on Student Movement Boulevard here. I was a Student Movement Boulevard here, but you know, Student Movement Boulevard it goes all the way over there to Jefferson County and to Birmingham, and a mile. Well, it really goes all the way over there to Bessemer, yeah. where where uh, out where uh, Miles College is. Uh, well, wait a minute. Well, is it Fairfield, Bessemer? Come on now, you know. Well, look, I know that they are, it's, although it's not in, just in proper Birmingham. All right, I've been there. In Alabama. But wait a minute, let me finish saying what I'm saying, because what I'm going to say is that, you know, we don't give enough shout out to the student movement in Birmingham. That's right. We don't talk about, you know, shutting down those stores in downtown Birmingham. Uh, and, uh, but there's a wonderful film. There's a wonderful film about the student movement in Birmingham, which I saw on Maryland Public Television yeah. living in D.C. So I, I think we need to get that film. Now, maybe they won't let you show it on on uh, Georgia Public Television, but I'll bet you they let you show it on uh, uh, the, the Atlanta Public Schools Public Television Station. Great film about the student movement there. Stand. Is it Stand is the name of it? Yeah, Stand. wonderful, wonderful Stand. film. And then, you know, uh, now I've been, I'm glad to be introduced, but I've been living in Atlanta since 1964 when I came here to go to Morehouse College, and they didn't have all these fences and walls between one campus and the other. And you, you kind of didn't know unless you'd been given a map when you had stepped off of the Morehouse campus and you were on the then Atlanta University campus, or you crossed the street and you were on the Clark College campus, or you took a left down uh, what was it then? It was Chestnut Street, Chestnut Street, and got over there to Beckwith and went down Beckwith, and you were then back on Atlanta University, and then you crossed on over, and you were on the Morris Brown campus, but you had to cross over the ITC campus to get to the Morris Brown campus. 
Yeah, so I mean, you know, so I'm just glad we're all in the Atlanta University Center again. We didn't have a Morehouse Medical School back then. But what we did have was a whole bunch of wonderful students committed to civic engagement and faculty and great presidents leading those institutions. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna, I wanna mention, so you know, we, you, you, you're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about erasing black history and intersectionality and all of these issues that, you know, sometimes it takes, you gotta have a PhD to quite understand. But I just wanna talk about two events that came to my mind today as I came onto this campus. The first was in about 1965 or 66, and there was a, gonna be a debate between Stokely Carmichael, you all heard of Stokely Carmichael? Yeah. Of SNCC, and uh, a member of the faculty of Morehouse College, uh, Reverend, what was Reverend Williams' name? He was the pastor of the Friendship Baptist Church. Samuel Williams, Sam Williams. And, and he was in the, I see somebody applauding down there. They must have recognized the name or they're just trying to get some attention. And, uh, <laughs> But Sam Williams was the pastor of Friendship Baptist Church. And he was a professor at Moore, and he was going to debate Stokely Carmichael on what? Black power. And they needed some place for that debate to take place. And they were going to initially have it, Dr. French, in Sale Hall Chapel. But it wasn't big enough. So they had to move it over to Davidge Auditorium on the Clark College campus. <laughs> and I remember it was standing room only. And, you know, Dr. Williams had, had the education and the academic credentials but Stokely Carmichael took him to school that evening and taught him a call. He, he, he didn't, he, Dr. Dr. Williams was courageous to, to do that, yeah. but it was a suicide mission <laughs> 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 to debate Stokely Carmichael, who did not play by the rules, and to debate him on the subject of black power. Now, this was a time when we were still, you know, weren't sure whether we were Negroes, African Americans, or black. But black was steadily creeping up on Negro, and uh, and that was one of the great moments of my educational experience as a student at Morehouse College. But to see two black men mm -hmm. with different points of view, and you know we do have different points of view in the black community, respectfully debating one another about an important issue of our times. And yes, I would say Black Power won. Uh, Stokely Carmichael was the victor. But the real winners were the people in the audience right. who got to hear people from our community debating an important issue that would define the future. Fast forward to April of 1968, just weeks before I was about to graduate from Morehouse College and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., father of Bernice and Yoki and Martin and Dexter, husband of Coretta son of Martin Luther King Sr. and I want to 
I, I keep wanting to say bunch, but I don't think I have the right to say that about Mrs. King, because that was what she was known as affectionately by her family. And I remember when that assassination occurred in the early evening, and the news came over the television and said that Dr. King had been assassinated in Memphis. Some of you are too young, others of you don't want to admit that you do remember quite well what happened. Uh, and I remember that that really put our community on edge. I was driving up here to the campus this, this afternoon and right there at the corner of Lowry and is that, what is that? That's fair, Stuart Fair. They've just leveled a little building. That was a, that was a store, a grocery store owned by a Jewish immigrant that was burned that evening. Anger over the death of Dr. King and all across the country. There wasn't much of it here in Atlanta. That was one of the examples of the anger the frustration. But all across the country, Washington, D.C., Detroit, yep. our cities were burning. Yet right here in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. King's earthly remains were brought back to this community, to this university community. He lay in state on the Spelman College campus where his mother had attended. Open casket. Thousands of people lined up all the way down Student Movement Boulevard off of the Spelman campus quietly waiting all night long to go by and pay their respects. And one of the things the students did was we held a silent march and we convened, this used to be Yates and Milton Drugstore, right here where we are today. This was the hangout, this was the corner. People hung out on the corner. People got their degrees on the corner. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, he owned that corner for, for quite some time. Uh, students convened and we convened, and I remember the march being right here between this building and Davidge, we were all convening students, silent march through our community down to Hunter Street, now Martin Luther King, up to the state capitol and silently marched around that state capitol and back to this campus to express with our silence and our ability to demonstrate in Atlanta, Georgia, our sense of the historic moment that we were in. And I remember not only that march, but I remember going over to Sisters Chapel and looking down into that casket and seeing the earthly remains of someone who had given his life so that we might have a better life, so that I might have a better life. And it was at that point that I said, whatever I do with my life, it can't just be about me. It's got to be to make a difference in the world in which we live. The one thing students at black colleges are taught is that we all have an obligation, a role, a responsibility, and the personal power to make a difference in the world. And so I'm really, so I, this is all bringing me back to being here today. That's why I think it's so important for the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation and the Thomas George Institute to be on this university campus and acknowledging in that that we all have a responsibility beyond the gates of the campus 
and, and the gates of the campus have to be wide open to the community. And that's what I think is gonna be happening under the leadership of Dr. George French, because that's what he has always done. And we're gonna have to stand by him, stand with him, and support him as he brings the world to Clark Atlanta University and Clark Atlanta University back out into the world. So let's give him a big hand. And that is my opening remark. Thank you. Thank you, President Lomax. And so we, the inaugural meeting was on yesterday, and we made it very clear what the mission was. What Dr. Lomax just contextualized for us even strengthens why we're here. We're here because it's time for think tank time. It's time that we develop a serious think tank. When I was speaking with uh, the commissioner from Jefferson County, my friend Sheila Tyson, we were talking about the fact that we have to engage data analytics now. When we go back to past campaigns, including the presidential campaign, and we couldn't, nobody, no one could really figure out what was going on, it's because he engaged data analytics, okay? It's time out for just saying, okay, we're gonna have a captain of this block and we're gonna know before you make a decision about running for state office, local office, national office, there are data that should be researched that we can that would indicate what percentage of, of any district we need. We're not just going holistically saying we're gonna win. No, we're gonna have to engage data analytics. We need you all. We need you from Georgia, from Florida, from Alabama. We need all of you and we're excited that it's on the campus of Clark Atlanta University. I thank Melanie, I thank Getcho, I thank the board for the wise decision to bring this initiative to Clark Atlanta University. And yes, when I say Clark Atlanta University, I am so proud to be the president. Let me tell you, the Bible talks about a first love also. So my first love was right there in Fairfield, Alabama at Miles College. So whenever I call Miles College's name, you know that's still also my heart. So my home people, you know I'm still right here with you and I love you, okay? Michael Lomax. Yes, sir. What can this organization do um, in concert with your over 37 member institutions? How can we motor, mobilize the United Negro College Fund to be in concert with the efforts of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation? Yeah. Great question and a challenging one uh, because I think it's gonna take uh, a different perspective on our campuses, as well as a different per perspective in the communities that are proximate to our campuses. You know, I've been going on black college campuses. I first set foot on a black college campus in January of 1961, when I got off a Greyhound bus with my mother and my five brothers and sisters at the stop across from Tuskegee Institute in a little old gas station, uh, which was not a black gas station, uh, in Tuskegee, Alabama, and was greeted by Dr. Charles Goode Gomillion, professor of sociology, who was there to receive us after a harsh journey across the Southland from Southern California to Tuskegee Institute, Alabama, where my mother, a journalist, was bringing her six children so she could write about the Civil Rights Movement. Now, was she crazy? Slightly, yes, no <laughs> doubt. Car broke down and we had to get on that Greyhound bus and that was our freedom ride. And I tell you, when we got to Big Springs, Texas, and they said, you can't come into this waiting room and you can't eat at this lunch counter, we started to have our own sit-in. But when that Texas um, police officer showed up and said, it's either go into the colored section or 
get on that bus or go to jail, sanity finally, <laughs> we got something to eat and we got on that, on that bus. But that was our harsh, that was two things happened, harsh introduction to racial segregation and then getting off that bus in Tuskegee and being met by a professor of sociology and taken over to Dorothy Hall and for the next two weeks living on that campus and receiving the warm embrace of the Tuskegee Institute community taught me that black colleges serve a big role in the communities in which they're located. You know, Tuskegee was, in 1961, there was a, the citizens of Macon County, Tuskegee, were boycotting the downtown in Tuskegee because they wouldn't integrate. So you, you, you couldn't buy anything there, you had to go all the way over to Auburn or to Montgomery or to the black, rest, the black stores that were in Tuskegee. And there was a real, th that, that boycott had been organized by the Tuskegee Civic Association led by Dr. Gomillion with the silent approval of the president of Tuskegee. But we were playing a role then. When the, when the student movement occurred in Atlanta, those, the presidents of Atlanta University and Morehouse and Spelman and Clark and ITC and Morris Brown, they gave support to the students to engage in transforming community. Since then, we kind of have put up walls around our campuses. We have security. We don't let the community onto the campus and we don't let the campus onto the community. So one of the things that has to change is our relationship to community. Now I'm not saying we can't, you know, we can't have safety and security. I taught at Spelman and we, we had people coming on campus and going into dorms and assaulting young women. We can't have that. But we have to realize that that community on the other side of that wall is us. And so I think part of what we need is leadership from the campuses, Dr. French, and from the communities like the National Coalition, helping us understand, helping us redefine the relationship between and among our black colleges and the communities that surround them. You know, we're doing a lot of uh, economic revitalization, but we're also doing a lot of neighborhood demolition. And we're seeing gentrification. Now, I want to know where did all the poor black folks go? And what are we going to do to ensure that some of the benefits of transforming our neighborhoods are happening to the communities, the people who are already. So I think there's work to be done. I think we gotta reorient ourselves uh, and say that, you know, these institutions are of, in, of, by, and for the black community. That's gonna take some, some different thinking, but we also have to engage the community about how we embrace and engage with institutions of higher education. And I think the most important thing that we can do, yes, we can do, we have to use the assets of the, com of the institutions, the educational assets, the research, the, the, uh, to, to do the work that only they can do in this, and having think tanks on our campuses and do tanks on our campuses, because thinking without doing is just, you know, it's, it doesn't, but, but I also think that uh, we have to reconsider what it is we do as our core work. Our single most important work we do is that we educate the future generations. And historically black colleges 
have always had an open door to students who couldn't find an open door at predominantly white institutions. Now, that doesn't mean that we were taking lesser people. We were just taking people who were a little bit different. We just had a young woman here, Bernice King. Now, there's a new book, a new biography of her father out. And uh, I started it this weekend. And the, it's very thick, very readable, though. But the, it begins by talking about Martin Luther King Sr whose name was Michael, until he changed it to, Malcolm, to, to Martin. But, uh, but he was born in Scottsboro. And he was born to sharecroppers. And when he decided to run off to Atlanta, he had a, he had a little bit of reading and a little bit of writing, but he didn't have much education. And when he, before he could go to Morehouse, he went to some school where they put him in the fifth grade. And he was in his, a big strapping guy in his 20s. And you know what he did? He settled into that fifth grade chair until he got to the point where he could get into Morehouse. And do you know what? John Hope, who was the president of Morehouse and Atlanta University, Mar Michael King, soon to be Martin Luther King Sr., often known as Daddy King, he failed that entrance exam three times, getting into Morehouse. And I only think it was because his, his girlfriend, who was this over at Spelman and the daughter of, uh, you know, a daughter of a uh, pastor over there at Ebenezer, uh, she, helped, she, she, she helped him along. But by the time I got to Morehouse, Martin Luther King Sr. was on the board of trustees and was one of the most distinguished alums of Morehouse College. Where people begin their education journey does not define where they will end their lives. So, you know, we gotta, we, yes, we have to be getting the best and the brightest, but we cannot turn our backs on the unpolished diamonds who just need a little bit, now maybe, maybe like, like Daddy King may have needed a whole bunch of help to get it right. But look what happened. So I, I think the, the role of the camp, we have to reconsider what the role of the institutions are. And so I'm a, one of the big proposals that we're making at UNCF is we want to have K through 12 schools either on our campuses or right next to our campuses. And, and, and we want them to, we want the kids who go to those schools to come from the communities proximate to our campus and we want them to prepare those young people to be students at our campus. Now, you know, it took Martin Luther King, I don't know what, he was in his 20s before he started Morehouse. But by the next generation, his oldest son began Morehouse at the age of 15. And the genes were there, you know, he could do it. The opportunity was there, he came to Morehouse and he flourished. I started Morehouse at 16. I don't claim to be a Martin Luther King, but I did pretty well, but my name is Michael. But I did, <laughs> but I did pretty well. You know, we got, we, I think we have to, I think that what I would just, I'm a long, I give long answers, you know. But I do think we have to think differently. We have to build new trust and new relationships between our black college campuses and our communities around them. Because this, the solution for our black colleges Enrollment growth, students, that's, that's right all around the campuses. You know, and how do, we, how do we embrace those communities and bring their students into uh, educational opportunity here? 
One other thing they had at Tuskegee when I was there in 1961, they had a school on the Tuskegee campus called Children's House. Children's House. And if you were lucky, you could get into Children's House. And I tell you, talk, you want to know about Children's House, you ask Lionel Richie about Children's House. And you could, and, and that was where they did their teacher training by teaching young people in the community and giving them an outstanding K through 12 education that prepared them to attend Tuskegee Institute or anywhere else that they wanted to go. Why don't we have those teacher training preparatory schools on our campuses? That could be a part of the solution. And then, you know, why aren't we doing economic development? And I know we're gonna do that under your leadership, which is not just bringing rich folks to live in our communities, but bringing people with different economic backgrounds into our communities. Pretty soon, you know, you, look, you cross, look over from where we are today into downtown Atlanta. That's priced out of most folks you come back on this side of North Side Drive, it's pretty soon gonna be priced out. Where, where did, where, when, when we did that marching around this community in April of 1968, one of the streets we went down was Sunset in Vine City on the other side of Hunter Street, now Martin Luther King, over by the, Morehouse, uh, the Morris Brown Stadium. Who lived on Sunset? Who lived in the community? Martin Luther King Jr. So we marched quietly by his home. And then we went down to the state capitol and came back. You can't find anybody living over here anymore we got to bring the community we got to bring or if we don't we're gonna wake up one day and find out the folks living in our neighborhood and don't look like our neighborhood and they and they won't be going to CAU unless they convert it <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that thorough answer thorough history I'm looking and I heard a few things Interestingly, um, a couple of the books that I'm reading now, you mentioned uh, Reverend King being from Scottsboro, and my mind goes back to this, this concept we have called being woke now. But some of you all will remember the protest song of the Scottsboro boys. In that song, it also spoke about being woke. What I'm suggesting is there is a similarity also like you said student movement running from Atlanta down through Birmingham and the, the 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 correlation of how we came to student movement it has a lot to do we understand what happened in 2014 in Ferguson we know what happened with Michael Brown we know what happened with Black Lives Matter after that but what we have to make sure we focus on is what is the strategic direction and process for po protesting. Give you an example, Deborah Scott, one of my graduates who's here. When, when the Howard University students uh, started protesting about housing, and then that ran right down here to the AUC, our students were prepared to protest, but Deborah asked the question, have you, have you submitted any demands yet, okay? Let's go back to the, the time that President Lomax was speaking of. Most presidents at HBCUs had to remain silent and support in the back, including President Lucius Pitts at Miles College, including Clemens right here. And when the students from Morehouse came, like Lonnie King came over, and he was insistent that they were going to protest, he walked into the room and all of the presidents were there, Morris Brown, Spellman, Morehouse, um, Atlanta University, Clark, all of them were there. 
And they said, no, we, 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 we don't want you going downtown to protest because once you get arrested, you're not gonna be able to do your homework and then you'll flunk out of school and you will have missed the mission. But President Clemens said, I'll tell you what I will do. If you all write up a list of demands, I'll come up with the money to run a full page ad right here in Atlanta in the newspaper. And they came up with their demands and right after that, Birmingham, the students at Miles College, they did the same thing in this we believe. They had to come up with demands. And I say to the students, even in protest, it's fine to go out and protest in the street all weekend. But on Monday morning, if you have not gotten anything because of the protest, we have not won. We have attention, but we, we have not won anything because we didn't have demands. So I'm counting on this organization, Melanie, to be that organization, and again, I'm glad you chose in Clark Atlanta to sit with our students in the AU Center, to tell the history like Dr. Lomax just did, because it repeats itself. It repeats itself, and it's going to get stricter even in Georgia. And one of the things I'm making sure that the young people understand that when that law in Georgia passed, that it becomes a felony to riot. And the question becomes, where is the distinction between protest and riot? We know what it is as academicians, but what are the police officers on the street going to say? Were you protesting? And if you were rioting, that is a felony now in Georgia. So we have to educate our students before we go out and protest whatever social justice issues that we are addressing, we need to make sure that our students are adequately informed, and that's why I need you all. That's why we need you all. And not just in Georgia, but in all of these states. Um, Melanie, how much time do we have? She's Did she say no? Did she say none? Is that what you said? Well, then we have, we have fulfilled our promise. <laughs> five minutes, five minutes. Okay, I wanna hear from Dr. Lomax um, one more time. We've got um, five minutes, let me see. UNCF has been masterful. Let me be clear. UNCF has been masterful in advocating for resources. I happen to serve now as the longest serving HBCU president in the nation. That means I've been here for a while, right? When I came the UNCF, we were counting on maybe a million dollars a year distribution to each school. Under President Lomax's leadership, we came up with a new model that included advocacy. And because of that model, many of our schools that would not have made it through COVID came out stronger than they went in because of the financial resources that the UNCF was able to bring through to the table, through the CARES Act, through HERF, by being on the Hill, by meeting with the secretary, by meeting with the president. I mean, millions of dollars. I mean, so I'm talking about, what am, I, what am I saying? French, are you talking about money? Let me speak to Clark Atlanta University. Because of the UNCF, the COVID funds that came to Clark Atlanta University that went to the university and directly to our students was about $100 million. That's to this school, okay? Tuskegee, I heard some Tuskegee fans out there. Because of the UNCF, we had over $100 million, about $135 million alone for giving at, Tus for giving at Tuskegee loan assistance, cap, um, capital finance, forgiven. So the UNCF has made an impact like never in their history. So I'm wondering, uh, Mr. President, since you've been so, so masterful, um, what do you anticipate um, that we can look for now that the COVID funds um, are, are gone, now that the George Floyd kind of uh, giving from that community, now that that's gone, what can we expect for additional resources to support the missions of our schools? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, what do college presidents do? Uh, college presidents and presidents of UNCF, we raise money. And because just like if you were a politician, I know we have a couple of elected officials, they say money is the mother's milk of politics. Well, money 
is the mother's milk of colleges and universities. And so we have been, we were very successful, as Dr. French said, in our championing, championing of federal financial support to black colleges beginning from, from 2020 through 2023. Over $6 billion of investment. That's unheard of in the, the amount of money. And, and just as it was a $100 million in building debt that was forgiven for, for Tuskegee, it was $1.6 billion in building debt that was forgiven across all of HBCUs. Wow. So they, you know, that's like, that's like having your loan, your mortgage, uh, you, know, you know, for your church, that's burning that church mortgage could, now. Could, could I, could I yeah, add go to ahead, that? Go ahead, go ahead. Could I add to that? One institution, I, I won't name, but very fortunate, they had consolidated all of their debt into the capital loan program. So when capital financing was forgiven for that institution, all of that debt wow. was forgiven. Yeah. Well, the, the Lord, there's nothing like luck and the Lord looking out for you, but you know, those, them days are over. And you saw what happened on this debt limit. They, they announced uh, that we're not, we not spending all that money. And you know, uh, they didn't say it, but those Republicans, they said, too many black people, too many black colleges got that money. We're not gonna make, make sure they doesn't get, don't get any more. So what I would say is, I'm not looking to the federal government for a whole lot of new money. I'm looking to the private sector for a lot of support. And as Dr. Dr. French has not told you, but he is co-chairing, well, first of all, he's chairing his own, he got his own capital campaign. He's, how much money are you raising, Dr. French? He's raising $250 million for, for Clark Atlanta University. But what he also hadn't told you is he is chair of the member presidents of the 37 members of the United Negro College Fund. And he is co-chairing along with myself and with Milton Jones, who is the chair of our board, the $1 billion capital campaign for the United Negro College Fund. And we're not raising any money from the federal government. We don't take money from the federal All that $1 billion we are raising from the private sector. And we have raised 43% of that $1 billion $430 million, but you know, we think, we're not saying this yet, but it's not the right $1 billion, that's good, but we, what we really want is to raise money for endowments for black colleges, because you know, endowments are the gift that keep on giving. So we wanna raise 750 million of that 1 billion has to be endowments. So we haven't raised but about 40 million of endowments. So we still got 700 more. You add 700 and 400 million. We got another, you know, we're gonna raise over a billion dollars in this campaign. That's the hard money. That's the smart money to raise though. Because when you have that and you can't spend it and you can only spend a certain amount of it and it keeps growing, that's what our colleges and universities must have and need. You know, when I first came to Atlanta, Atlanta University had the largest endowment. They had about $20 million. And uh, through some tough times, that money declined. The wealthiest black college at the time, I don't know, I think it was still Howard at the time. But back then, Spelman had about $14 million endowment. You watch out for those black women, man, I'm telling you. They got $500 million over there in endowment today. Wow. Well, excuse me, now we gotta catch up. You got, we got, the brothers gotta play some catch up. <laughs> we gotta catch up at CAU, we gotta catch up at Morehouse, and at UNCF, we are committed and determined to being the first black institution to have a $1 billion endowment. Wow. No one has it yet. So that's what we gotta do. So the name of the game of the future, and, uh, and so you better treat me right, because we gonna have a billion dollars. Uh, <laughs> but it's gonna be, it's really private fundraising. And I'm gonna tell you, I will close with this. Education is critically important for the economic future of black America.
But I'm going to tell you one of the things that we need to educate black people on doing is raising and saving money and building assets. So, so financial, so that, that's the other piece of it. And, you know, we're pretty good at that at UNCF, so we're going to open a fundraising institute. And we, 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 we believe that some of these civic organizations need to come and take some classes from us and learn how to raise, learn, learn how you. to raise some money. And we do, we do charge a fee to teach you how to fish. Got we, got but, but, it, but we might give you a special discount for the National Association. Thank you. Civic participation. Give Lomax a hand, everybody. <laughs> I was about to say, give Dr. Lomax a hand, everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. President. <laughs> Melanie? Y'all gonna get French hands? Yeah. 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 Uh, that was a trick, Doc. Doc, first and foremost, thank you, Dr. French. Thank you, Dr. Lomax. This was a, this was awesome, and uh, and I and I do expect that scholarship. Yeah, I want that scholarship to raise that money, and we I'm learning how important money is. Uh, power of the buck. Uh, so can we give them another round of applause and thank that and, and, and Dr. French. I, I can't tell you a cut off in your house, just so you know. Oh, I yeah. got, I got Y'all a trick question. I got it. That was a trick question. That was a trick They said, my friend Sue Ross in the house. If you know Atlanta, if you don't know Sue Ross, you, you, if it, you, you, you gotta know. And uh, Sue is great to see you. When I worked for the late Maynard Jackson, even before Maynard Jackson, when I was just a young uh, that ran around with uh, Blue Crew with doing Andrew Young's campaigns. Um, but Sue uh, is a walking history book besides being uh, her old, she, was, was, so you ran the uh, uh, Office of Contract Compliance uh, when I was at City Hall. Uh, so she knew how to deal with the money and getting black folks resources. Uh, she's also uh, a, 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 a renowned uh, photographer, storyteller. What else? Who's, that's our sister and taking care. I, I, I troll her, we troll each other on Facebook. We, uh, we'll get there, we'll get to Instagram soon enough, right? But, Definitely on Facebook. So great to have you in the room. Um, so everybody okay? Yes. Um, so with movement and organizing, you shift, right? So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to move our Power of the Buck panel uh, uh, discussion up. And what we're going to ask people to do, if you need a break, stand up now, just, everybody's going to stretch. But if you need a break, just take it, right? Now, not, not 50 people at one time. <laughs> uh, but we're gonna ask folks just to take your breaks when you need them, because we know it's been a lot. Uh, but we do have a couple of folks um, that are ready. Let me know if we're ready for uh, the White House. We have a couple of folks, who, uh, Stephen Benjamin, uh, who is with the White House Office of Public Engagement, wanted to be here. But you know, that, that thing called the debt ceiling stuff going on, so he, and he's from South Carolina. Uh, but we have Aaron Wilson, who's the Deputy Chief of Staff for Vice President Kamala Harris, who they, they really wanted to physically be here, but they didn't want to not miss being here to bring some remarks. So I'm trying to find out from our team if she's ready. She's ready, y'all just let, let us know when she's on the screen. Um, so bring some remarks. Um, we have Kim Crenshaw, Dr. Kim Crenshaw, who is actually in Italy who wanted to be here to, to talk about the Freedom to Learn campaign that uh, Dr. Reverend Siobhan, uh, which is the, you know, uh, a fight that's continued to go on and expanding to fight back against banning uh, our history uh, from this nation who wanted to join. So she wants to join uh, live from Italy. So when we get a chance, we'll bring, bring her up. Anybody ready? Who's ready? 
Everybody all right? <laughs> Hello, can you guys hear me? Is that Dr. Krisha? Hey, Dr. Krisha, how are you? Hi, um, so, um, Hi. How are you? Hello, how are you today? Hi, so we have, so, so hold on. Can y'all put them on mute for a second? Put them on mute? Give them mute, mute, mute them out. Y'all can't mute them. Ladies, now I have both of you all on at the same time. Can you all hear me, Kent, Dr. Crenshaw? And Aaron, can they hear me? Okay. Yes, I can, I can hear you. Okay, so, okay, um, Aaron and, and Dr. Crenshaw, both of you are here at the same time. So I'm gonna ask, which one of you all wanna go first? Uh, it needs to go first, because we, we will try to have y'all separate with the time. Oh, That's okay. It's okay. Well, I, I know you had, <laughs> but you're you're out of the country. Aaron, are you okay? Dr. Crenshaw, what's gonna? Are you okay? What's your time window, Aaron? Is, is it just the six of us? No, no, no. You're you're addressing a whole room of about a hundred people. You probably can't see us. Yes. <laughs> the other folks are in the background. You're live. You're live. And Dr. Crenshaw. Is, is here and you all ended up here at the same time. So I'm trying to find out which one of you all can, uh, needs to go first. Cause I know Dr. Crenshaw, you're in Italy, but Kim, I know you, uh, Aaron, I know you're at the White House. So y'all tell me. Well, I, I'm happy to go first. Okay. Only Aaron because I have a flight to pass. Okay, is Aaron, you okay? So Dr. Crenshaw, go ahead. We, we're glad to have you join us. Uh, we want, first of all, can we give Dr. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw a hand, she's a scholar, professor, co-founder, and executive director of African American Policy Forum, and has been in this fight. Uh, and so we're gonna turn it over to you uh, to just uh, share your words about what's happening with the Freedom to Learn campaign. In, in any ways we can keep the fight going uh, in partnership with you. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, it's just such an honor and, and a pleasure to have this opportunity um, to speak with you all. And uh, anytime I, my sister Melanie asked me to uh, show up, I want to be able to do that no matter what. So that's what today uh, looks like for me. I'm just going to speak very quickly about what has become uh, the Freedom to Learn campaign. My hope uh, is that you've you've read about it, you've heard about it. I heard uh, my sister Siobhan um, bringing the message earlier today, just over the phone. So um, I know that you all are um, uh, here and aware of the kind of things that we are fighting against. Um, Freedom to Learn is basically a campaign that is designed to take the high ground and demand uh, not just the end of censorship, the end of the efforts to make our history unteachable, to make our reality unlearnable, um, which in turn is meant to make the capacity to change and to better our situation unachievable. Um, we're all about connecting the dots between the attacks on uh, what has been called critical race theory, the more recent attacks on black history, and importantly, not just the legislation that has now been passed in 22 states and counting, uh, but legislation that has been introduced in 49 states. This is not just a red state phenomena. This is something that's happening uh, in blue states as well as red states. It's something that ha that's happening at the level of school boards as well as all the way up uh, to decisions that have been made by attorney general uh, offices across the country. Um, the most immediate issue um, that led to this growing, uh, galvanizing uh, Freedom to Learn Day in which all of the Divine Nine, all of the Big Eight, the voting rights groups, the teachers' organizations came together to demand the right to learn uh, was a decision made by the, uh, the College Board to abide by the demands 
of the DeSantis administration to take away critical concepts and content from the African American Studies course that was finally adopted after years of struggle, adopted because of all of the mobilization in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder, all of the mobilization after Breonna Taylor. Finally, there was an opportunity to have a course that would teach about the history of blackness in this country, the history of what we've contributed, but also the history of struggle, and bringing it to bear to help young people understand the world in which we are born into and what we have done to transform it and what yet needs to be done in order to transform it. Once this course was finally adopted uh, or created, uh, states like those that I mentioned earlier that had adopted this anti-woke, anti-racism, anti-CRT legislation began to say that these kinds of courses cannot be taught in their states. So specific things could not be taught like uh, structural racism, like reparations, like intersectionality, like black feminism, like queer black studies. These are all integral parts of our ability to tell our story in a way that allows people to understand where we have come from and where we need to go. So because this became such a clear example of what the anti-woke people were trying to censor, why they don't want people to know the story about Ruby Bridges, why they don't want to tell the truth about segregation, why they don't want to have critical concepts to help understand. Once that became clear, then the only thing that was left to do was to protest and to demand a retraction of the elimination of important concepts, an end of the censoring of our history and our art and our voices, and the creation of a more inclusive vocabulary, a more inclusive um, uh, history of our country that allows us not only to exercise our knowledge, but to also see the dots connected between um, our right to learn, our right to vote, our right to exist. So I'm really excited about this opportunity and I was so honored uh, to work with uh, our sisters uh, who are leaders in uh, the civil rights aid. And I just wanna close with um, a, a quick video that can show the power, the energy, the love uh, that came together on uh, May 3rd and what we hope will be the future of a successful campaign to take back our stories. And Destiny is going to share the screen, I think. Hi, can I have um, screen sharing access, please? Thank you. Thank you. 
black brothers have been resilient for 400 years, and you can't stop us now. We are united, and we are here today for our freedom to learn. And that we may do the work of liberation and defense of our history, yes. of our freedom, and of our people this day. There would be no history without black history in this country. There would be no White House without the backs of slaves that it was built on. There would be no American culture without black culture. So do not touch our history. Because if you don't include everybody's history, you're not preaching real history. We ask your peace among us, yes. your care for all who journey with us, and your power be amplified among us. We already know who gonna win in the end. Because we want all the smoke because if God is for us, who can be against us? We want all the smoke because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We want all the smoke because Kendrick Lamar is still right. All my life I had to fight, but if God's got us, we gonna be all right. We too woke and we want all the smoke. children our story ourselves because the freedom to learn is the freedom to live and the freedom to live is liberation for our people and we shall be free. So we hope that you all um, are inspired to get involved in Freedom to Learn. Um, there's a freedomtolearn.net uh, uh, website where you can find ways that you can get involved if you have five minutes, if you have five hours, five days, five weeks. Um, we also uh, encourage you to sign the letter demanding that uh, African-American studies courses be returned uh, and not be censored, not be excised. And we ask you to reach out and clarify for people that this attack on anti-racism is an attack on all that we have created over the last 50 years to demand the right to full equality in, and, and justice. This is an attack on our ability to vote, on our ability to understand, our ability to teach, and our ability to learn. We're not going to let them turn us back. Together, the freedom to learn will be real. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I look forward to answering any questions and engaging in, in, in any way that helps promote our common and collective interests. Thank you. Th thank you. Th thank you, Dr. Crenshaw. Thank you, Dr. Crenshaw. Kim, thank you so very much. We know you moving and grooving over there. Be safe in your travels. Uh, and we love you. We appreciate you there. And we say freedom to learn. Freedom to learn. Freedom to learn. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Crenshaw. Love you so much. And now I think we have Erin Wilson on the screen. Uh, she's Deputy Chief of Staff for Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, at least she was there. She's still there? Oh, okay. He's coming right back. Everybody all right? Yeah. Who's got uh, that kind of stuff going on in your state? Raise your hand. With abandoned books. Florida? Florida. Alabama. 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 Mississippi. Mississippi. Alabama. South Carolina? 
Georgia. Freedom to learn, it's real. All right, Aaron, how you doing today? Can you hear me? Can't you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Hi, how are you? It's we know you're, you know you got to get to another meeting, so we want to welcome you to our convening. Uh, I know you have the background already, so just let us know what's happening up there uh, in Washington with Biden-Harris. We know y'all are fighting the fight around the debt ceiling, but share with us. We're here. Our, our theme is power of the, the ballot, the buck, and the book, and that gets to black liberation. So give us uh, um, an update from the White House. Floor is yours. You got it. Well, one, thank you for having me with you. I am, or having me join you remotely. I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you in person. Um, in my head, I am imagining a beautiful room filled with some incredible and dynamic organizers and um, exactly the audience of people that I would love to uh, be spending the full extent of my day with. So I'm, I'm so sorry to, to not be able to join you, but very excited about this inaugural convening and truly excited for the opportunity to address you today. Um, uh, as with any day, uh, and, and as I'm sure all you busy ladies know, you get pulled into a, a million different directions. So I appreciate uh, you helping to find a time uh, where we could make this work. Um, it's just really exciting to think about the power of, of each and every one of you. And I thank you all for the work that you're doing, um, notably in response to some of the attacks that we have seen on our, our fundamental rights and freedoms. Um, and I, I serve as deputy chief of staff to the vice president and um, you know, we often reflect about seeing this moment um, for what it is and in the context of the history that we live and in the context of the future that we must shape and um, really looking at some of the work that we are seeing to, to roll back hard fought rights um, and, and, and hard won fights at the state level. Um, as really a plan to take an agenda at the state level, an, an extremist agenda, and, and make it nationally. That these attacks that we may be seeing in places like Florida and Texas are not only about the people of those states, but are uh, about the country uh, far beyond that, of course. Um, and that each of these pieces, these attacks on the right to vote, these attacks on preventing the teaching of America's full history, on condemning Americans for who they love, for uh, telling a woman, for restricting a woman with um, the decision she's able to make at her own body, um, to fight for uh, safe and, and effective gun uh, gun prevention, gun violence prevention reforms. Those are all um, pieces that uh, we have really worked to shine the, the national spotlight on and attention and really talk to those that are convening um, in states as collaborative partners in um, helping to unify our agenda and pushing back against each of those um, against each of those pieces. So I want to spend a little bit of time, and um, I say a little intentionally because I know you have a, a full agenda. I want to talk to you about some of the work that, that we're doing, some of the things that you would have seen the vice president, um, some of those spaces. And you know, I think most within this room would, would say that um, they have consistently seen the vice president lending her voice in the administration's uh, efforts to defend reproductive health care. Um, we have hosted more than 45 convenings on reproductive rights since the Supreme Court, and that's discussion or convenings that include empowering and partnering and collaborating with civil rights leaders, reprodu reproductive justice leaders, patients, advocates, faith leaders, because we believe that you do not have to abandon your faith and personally held beliefs to believe that the government does not have a right to tell a woman what to do with her own body. Um, privacy experts, students, disability rights leaders, university presidents, doctors, state legislators, legislators um, with the understanding of we will need a broad coalition coalition on not this but on all of these issues that we are working to protect um, when you look at the states where we have seen um, attacks on voting rights on LGBTQ plus rights and reproductive rights you can see if you look at all of those in co and um, holistically there is quite a bit of overlap in those states that are attacking two, if not all three at the same time. And what does that tell us? That tells us that there are coalitions at work here, and in many cases, unlikely coalitions, but there are coalitions at work that are driving each of these agendas forward, and we need to replicate that coalition work in, in terms of organizing ourselves. Um, 
Folks are likely aware that um, medication abortion has most recent, has recently come under attack. We've been working very closely. Um, we announced, uh, President Biden announced a presidential mem memorandum to protect access to medication abortion and has also announced some administration actions to protect patient privacy. Um, and in the space of women's health, um, one of the spaces that the vice president has um, spent quite a bit of time in terms of bringing it to the forefront of the national conversation is the space of black maternal health. Um, more than 30 states have expanded um, postpartum Medicaid coverage from two months to 12 months following the vice president's recent call to action. And we've also announced a whole of government strategy to ensure safe childbirth. Uh, now, why is this significant? You know why this is significant, but we want to make sure everyone knows why this is significant. Because black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes, native women twice as likely, and rural women to one and a half times as likely. And so we are going to continue to elevate that discourse um, in the space of women's health um, within the dialogue and conversation of where we can, where we have opportunity to continue to be more engaged and lead. Um, a big part of this fight is really showing up where it matters. And uh, as someone that has the um, honor and privilege of traveling with the vice president, I can say that uh, we have shown up when it matter, when and where it has mattered most for people, uh, but in, notably including in the fight for, uh, to protect Americans from gun violence um, and to protect our democracy. Uh, we've met with many communities uh, from Atlanta, Monterey Park, Buffalo, Highland Park, to mourn with families and to call for common sense gun reform. Uh, she recently traveled, as I, I would hope folks know, to Nashville to meet with the Tennessee Three um, and delivered just an incredible speech highlighting the administration's support for common sense gun reform and the wrongful suspension of these two of these of those two young leaders. Um, and really reminding um, young Americans that, you know, folks like Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, uh, you know, it's it's no surprise that they are two people in their 20s. But when we look back at the civil rights movement and such, uh, really making sure that we are reminding folks at what a young age uh, John Lewis was when he led his efforts for um, civil rights. And, and carry that through in his, in, his, in his later years, leading a sit-in on the Hill on the very same topic, um, but helping, to, helping young folks to continue to feel empowered. And a, a big piece of going to Tennessee um, immediately following their expulsion was to be very clear that these attacks on democracy will not be met with silence. And so showing up where it matters, continuing to, um, ex continuing to express urgency in the moment in terms of response is such a big piece of how we continue to fight back and push back and achieve success in, in the states. And we've seen that happening. It's, it's very exciting to hear that Tennessee is gonna be convening a special session in August. We've seen um, Maryland Governor Moore, we've seen in, in Minnesota, Governor Walls uh, take some action. And it is, it is exciting to see those spaces and really understanding the power that we have, um, the power that we have in the states. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, just some top lines on some other key pieces that we've been working with. We've, we've obviously had a historic first year of this administration that we're incredibly proud of um, in terms of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we have uh, the vice president has uh, continued has traveled around the country on um, notably. Um, lifting up the places where we have been able to address issues of clean water, lead pipes, um, wildfires, um, electric vehicles, job creation, and environmental justice. Um, and why is this significant? This is significant because in eight years, this administration is going to replace all lead pipes in America. And each of these pieces relate back to not only the fight for climate change, but the fight for environmental justice. Um, and lastly, um, I'll just talk a little bit about the vice president, some of the work that we've done on, on the world stage, because how America is, leads, is, uh, leads democratically is, uh, is, um, um, is a model that we set before the world. And the vice president's met with over 100 world leaders in strengthening Americans' alliances. Um, but one of the pieces that um, I'm most excited about is her recent trip to the continent of Africa, uh, where she used the same strategy that she's employed in Central America um, in terms of leveraging public-private partnerships. In Central America, we leverage about $4.2 million of public-private partnerships invested in the region to help stem the root causes of migration. Um, and we leveraged about $8 billion in private sector investments in the continent of Africa for a very similar strategy. Um, that's on women empowerment, that's on um, 
uh, climate mitigation um, and, and technological investment. And those are all pieces um, that stand back to America's role in the world in, in leading and helping to both domestically and globally address some of the greatest challenges that we are facing. So Melanie, that's that's a long, short overview. We've got a lot going on. Um, tomorrow's Gun Violence Prevention Day. We're gonna, so it's, it is top of mind for us as we um, head to Virginia. Um, the June 24th is gonna be the anniversary of the Dobbs decision, uh, which again is, is is an incredibly significant date as, as we think through where were we, you know, this time last year, um, we had a we had a right um, that no longer exists following the Dobbs ruling. And so it'll be, it's an important moment as we think through who we are as a country and you know where we see ourselves going moving forward. And that's not to mention um, the attacks that we have seen and continue to see on, on voting rights so far as to not even allow, allow people to offer water to, to those waiting in line. Um, so you know we have we have quite a bit of work to do, and, and a big piece of that is building out strong coalitions and partnerships in the state, and which is one of the reasons why I was um, honored to be here and have the invitation to address you today. Thank, thank you, Aaron. We appreciate it. Y'all keep fighting the fight. Appreciate you. Um, um, we're going to. This is how we're going to close out. Everybody okay? I know. It's like no breaks. Remember, take a break when you need a break. It's not 50 at a time. Just get up and leave when you need to. We're going to move right into our last uh, power uh, discussion, power of the buck. Say power of the buck. Power of the buck. Power of, the buck. Power of, the buck. Power of money. Right? Power of money. Uh, we will be discussing economic empowerment, justice, and uh, closing the wealth gap uh, strategy. Topics will include digital equity and connectivity, equal pay, DNI, diversity and inclusion, entrepreneurship, workers' rights, livable wages, work family policies such as child care, paid family leave, pregnancy protection. I'm going to facilitate if you all will bear with me uh, this segment. Uh, and we're going to start off with a brief presentation from Melissa Hansberg. Uh, Melissa, come on up. Melissa is Senior Manager of Insights and Research. Can we give us some some power love come on uh, come on up sister uh she has a presentation for about 10 minutes on the economic anxiety and how it's impacting black america some really really rich uh content and if we can queue up our um next lead discussions we'll follow her uh and i'll call your name once we come in. so if you all get ready as soon as she's done we're going right into our final and then then what we're going to do we are not leaving out what we wanted to do, which was strategy. Uh, we're gonna shift that a bit. So the state facilitators, what we're gonna do after we finish this last panel is we're gonna bring you all up in groups of, uh, in two groups to share your strategy. Those of you all who are here, who wanna give uh, st uh, strategy discussions, where's Makani? And she'll come up after this last uh, panel. Start putting it on your note, uh, uh, notes of what you solutions you see and we're going to have folks from your table put those up on those state uh, on, on those state sheets over uh, with the yellow paper over there, <laughs> right? Um, so we're going to have uh, so so those of you all who are facilitators, we're going to break you up into two groups to have a conversation. So you share from your state perspective what you see as solutions, and those of you all uh, who have thoughts who won't be up here for that to put your thoughts on paper as well. And we're going to gather all of that information. So just kind of be ready for that. There we go. Okay, I'm on. Hi everyone. Today, today I'll be talking about the economic anxiety and its impact on the black community. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. A little bit, there we go. Okay, so before we jump into my presentation, um, I wanted to let you all know a little bit about myself. I was moved by the discussions yesterday, and I thought that I would start my presentation a little bit different than I had initially planned. I know a lot of people out there, probably 90% of you, other than um, my statistics profession, thank you. Probably most of you, other than my professor, um, my previous professor, Dr. Brown, uh, probably don't know who I am. 
and if you're looking at your program, um, to no fault of anyone's, my last name is spelled incorrectly. So as I start this presentation, I want to let you know who I am. My name is Melissa Hansberry. I am the wife of Nicholas Carl Hansberry. He is the great grandson of Carl Augustus Hansberry the first. That might not ring a bell, or you might not know who Carl was, but I'll tell you a little bit about him. He was a black man in real estate, a real estate broker in Chicago. He moved into a neighborhood called Hyde Park. And in 1940, he was told to leave the neighborhood. Hansberry v. Lee was the Supreme Court case that determined that black Americans were allowed to live and desegregate the city of Chicago. His daughter, who you might know as Lorraine Hansberry, went on to tell this story in A Raisin in the Sun. So when I speak to you today, please understand that this is all within me. So just a little bit about more about Carl. At the same time that he was fighting economic e inequality in Chicago, his brother, William Leo Hansberry, was attending Atlanta University. He was a student of Du Bois, and as fate would have it, my husband would end up following his great great uncle to Clark Atlanta University, and I would be as interested as I could in W.E.B. Du Bois, and that would lead me to Clark Atlanta University. So my interest in Du Bois, as I said, is what brought me here to, to this great university. And at the time, when I started my matriculation here, I hadn't even scratched the surface of what I understood about Du Bois. Yesterday, Dr. French talked a little bit about W.B. Du Bois and the sacred ground that we stand on today. And I would just like to say, you know, a lot of people look at him as a historian or a social activist, but what a lot of people don't know is that he was a pioneer of data, data visualization. The Georgia Negro, a study and a series of statistical start, charts illustrating the conditions of descendants of African slaves and in the United States of America was one of his first works, which was groundbreaking to, um, the two black Americans in this country to fight and not accept scientific racism at the time. Du Bois didn't, didn't sit down, he chose to fight. With little resources, at him and the students at Atlanta University did what we do best. He found a way or made one. And he changed the narrative of black economics in the South. So I feel so humbled and privileged to be here with you today, to be continuing the legacy that Du Bois has, has laid in front of us. This is the history and the legacy that we need to protect for our future leaders and this distinguished university. Next slide. So now on to my presentation. Um, a little bit about what I'll go over today. First, I'll talk about the company that I work for, then black economic power, the anxiety for black Americans, and then what we should do as a path forward. So, who, so where do I work for? I said a little bit about myself, but I work for a company called MyCode, which is the largest digital multicultural company in the United States. We work with over 1,100 owned and operated publishers which directly reach black, Hispanic, and Asian American consumers, consumers and voters nationwide. Our company was started in 2015, but since then we have become a trusted leader in multicultural digital research. Specifically within the organization, I work under the B Code umbrella. The B Code umbrella is designed to empower brands and campaigns with the tools and resources to deliver impactful messages to, and culturally nuanced messages to consumers and voters. Specifically within the business, I am a researcher and I conduct studies to uncover attitudes and behaviors of black Americans. So I've prepared some research um, for you all today, which is mostly on a national view. And where the data permitted, I was able to pull out some statistics on some of the southern states um, that you all come from here today. So the economic power. 
The black population today is increasingly, is growing and increasingly diverse. Since 2010, 89%, there's been 89% growth in those that identify as multicultural black. When I'm talking to brands and I'm talking to companies about their marketing strategy, one of the things that I like to say and like to discuss is that black consumers and voters are not a monolith. This means that everyone doesn't necessarily identify as African American. And what you can see here is that one of the largest populations that are growing in this country actually come from the Caribbean and Africa. Next, let's talk a little bit about the economic power. We talked about this yesterday, and again, I was moved by that and how um, we can use economic power to change our st stance. So the black economic power is strong with nearly two, uh, nearly two trillion. In comparison to 2020, black buying power is in projected to increase by 26%. So like in the discussions yesterday, we talked about consumers using their economic power to push change. This is a powerful message to me because if you can see in the map um, to the, uh, I guess the other side of your presentation, a majority of the states that hold the highest economic power are here in the South. And when we think about black consumers buying power as a whole, this surpasses the GDP of countries, countries, like Russia, Brazil, Australia, and Spain. So what can we do if we put um, our economic power towards pushing change? So as we prepare for the future and anticipate population and economic growth among black Americans, it's important to understand what economic stressors they face today. This is why at B Code, the research that I conduct takes a deeper look into national economic trends that are top of mind for black Americans and how they are responding to these pressures. Currently, 44% of black Americans feel that the US economy has worsened in the past six months. 52% are afraid that a recession is on the horizon. Additionally to this, 45% feel that currently that they are having extreme pressure to make ends meet. When we take a look at the South and compare it to the national average, black adults are more concerned about a potential recession. Here in the state of Georgia, that's 55%, 61% in South Carolina and Texas at, Texas, I'm sorry, at 59% and South Carolina at 61%. In the face of a recession, higher cost of goods and services, higher health care costs, declining job stability, and continuous interest rates are among the top areas of concern for black American Democrats. Economic inflation is the third highest issue impacting on how black voters plan to vote in 2024, followed by housing affordability and health care. So now let's dive a little bit deeper into these issues. Currently, what we're seeing in the state of Georgia is that 59% of black Americans say they're spending significantly more on their daily items like food and groceries in comparison to what they were spending last year. South Carolina is even higher at 63% and Texas is leading at 64%. Another important issue is health care. 45% of black Americans say that they disapprove of how the government is handling health care. This is extremely important as we move into the 2024 election because health care has an impact on how a quarter of black voters say they plan to vote and how and nearly a quarter of black Southern voters in Georgia, South Carolina, and Texas say they feel currently like they're spending significantly more on things like medication and healthcare visits. Now let's talk about job stability. When we compare the job market to last year, 31% of black Americans say they perceive the market to be worse than it was six months ago. 
Looking into the future of what consumers feel their jobs will be, 61% of black Americans feel that, that, their, that AI poses a serious threat to their job future, while 60% say that automation poses a threat as well. Now this topic, again, like I mentioned about myself in the beginning, is near and dear to my heart because I know that in this country, home ownership is the path to wealth and for most. And in addition to the information on this slide, the Boston Consulting Group did a study and found that white families transfer wealth between generations three times the, at three times the rate as black families do. 26% of white families report receiving inheritance compared to only 8% of black families. This puts black families at a disadvantage right out of the gate. So when we think about housing affordability and how it's a barrier to generational wealth, 56% of black voters agree that it has an influence on how they plan to vote in 2024. This average is 8% higher than the total US average voters. And what is astonishing to me and concerning is that federal statistics show that the rate of home ownership among black, Amer black Americans is at the lowest national level since segregation was legal. So since, since segregation, we are at currently the lowest rate of home ownership. Only 20% of black Americans under 35 own their home. Here specifically in this city of Atlanta, there's a negative 17.2% gap in black home ownership to whites, and Georgia has a gap of negative 25%. This is ex extremely concerning when we see black voters emphasizing housing affordability as a top voting issue in 2024. 26% of Americans in South Carolina and 37% in Georgia and Texas say they feel like they're spending more on housing than they were last year. So what is our path forward? What, what, how do we prepare for the future and, um, and recognize the issues that black Americans are facing? We listen to them. In our research, I found that 41% of black voters want change and they want their voice to be heard. I know that that's what all of you out there are dedicated to doing each and every day, is making sure that their voice is heard and that the change is resonating. Here at MyCode, that's my mission as well. My goal at MyCode is to make sure that I am providing culturally relevant insights that can connect you to the audiences that you are trying to reach. We've demonstrated this at MyCode with awards in leading in targeting and reaching consumers um, of diversity around the country. Before we can get My ancestors had to go through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Powerful. So we got what? We got work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Can we give Melissa a hand? So we're going to move this thing along to our, our, our next group of lead discussants to so call your name, come on up. Cleo, and can we put some music to this? Can we get some music for our next panel? People, we ready? Cleo LeBrown, National President, A. Philip Randolph Institute. Jocelyn Fry, Nash, uh, National President, National Partnership for Women and Families. Milton H. Jones, Jr., founding member, Peachtree Providence Partners, holding company, LLC, treasurer of the board, 100 Black Men of America, Incorporated, and he's also chair of UNCF, am I right? Yes, many hats. 
he, not, he retired, but he didn't retire, right? He just took five more jobs. Carol Jordan, Executive Director, Family Values Action. Jocelyn Tate, Senior Tech Policy Advisor, uh, Program Manager, Black Women's Roundtable, Digital Equity and Women's um, Empowerment Project. And to Antonisia Tony Wiley, MHA, Senior Director, Advocacy, National Urban League. And I believe we we're gonna have someone from the National Black Caucus of State Legislators come up. And I don't know if Paula's still in the room. She was or if one of your leaders. Just come on up, Paul. And we're gonna we have, we're gonna get family close. And we're good. All right, everybody okay? All right. And what I'm going to ask folks to do is when we're done with this panel, we're going to bring up our uh, uh, leaders from states uh, in two groups to have a conversation with you all, with all that we've heard. And again, if you uh, have ideas about next steps, solutions, put it on a sticky, make sure we put it up on that board for your state. I can't see which state is where, but it's on both sides of the wall wall and window. All right. Technology works when it works. Yeah, yeah, help me out so I can get this, get my questions in front of me. There we go. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Thank you, uh, Cleola. How you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? Good. So we're going to start out with you. And remember, the conversation is, the power, is about the power of the buck. And so over the years, there have been significant rollbacks in labor protections and workers' rights. What are some of the most significant rollbacks? And how have those rollbacks impacted us when it comes to um, uh, in income, inequality, and wealth building? Okay, well, thank you, Sister Melanie, first of all, for always being inclusive. She never leaves labor out of the mix of anything, thank God. But I tell you what, this has been a learning experience for me, listening to all of you and really following all of the conversations, because I heard your little side conversations too, y'all, because I'm nosy, okay? <laughs> and I learned a lot about each and every, most of you. Uh, but before I go any further, I wanted to thank the sister from my, what is it, my code? Uh, I know, my code. Uh, B code. What is it, B code? B code. B code. After listening to you, I wanted to fight somebody for sure. I wasn't quite sure who, but I definitely wanted to pick a fight with somebody. Let me digress just from a second, for a second from the original question. I found it quite interesting what you said and some of your statistics. But I'll tell you what really caught me was when you talked about the three states that were involved, all of those states were states that matched the dilemma that we're facing right now. For Georgia, South Carolina, and Texas, those were farming states. And most of those states had black farmers in it who were in the mix of producing food for us. Y'all following what I'm saying? And then there was no money given to those farmers to continue doing that work to provide not only to the general masses of this country, but to our communities in particular. We used to get stuff off the truck in the back from black farmers at a reduced rate and still be able to do what we had to do. And I'm not talking 900 years ago, y'all. I'm only 74, gonna be 75 pretty soon. But oh, every hey, bit hey. of it made a difference. 
And that's an economic hit that you get right away when your food starts being jacked around, when you cannot afford that piece. And you talked a little bit too, when you, uh, you raised something in my head a little bit about those three states again. All three of those states were high in manufacturing. There were manufacturing plants in Georgia and in Texas and in South Carolina. That's where clothes got made. That's where they made products made in America again. And that's where we had entry level jobs so that if you wanted to work, work was there. All gone, almost all of them offshore. That hits the pocketbook almost immediately too. But as we get into the question at hand, Melanie, and I, I heard what you were saying, and I'm trying to do what you told me to do, and I'm gonna do it quick too, all right? When I think about the question itself, I think about Asa Philip Randolph. I'm Clayola Brown, I'm the only female that has ever been president of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, but I guarantee yes. you, yeah, thank you. I guarantee you I won't be the last because I'm looking hard for a sister to take my place. I'm ready to go, y'all. <laughs> and a piece of that means that the mentoring piece that comes along is ever present. And if we just talk about it and don't do nothing about it, you're a big old liar and, I, and the truth ain't in you. But anyway, Randolph, along with his co-founder, Byard Rustin, uh, came to the forefront of what it means to be solid in your beliefs. Because labor didn't open up their arms to Randolph in the beginning. They were rejected. Randolph organized the sleeping car porters, did a doggone good job of it, got the economy going where jobs of dignity existed. You following me? We were able to send our news up and down the East Coast by these porters that traveled. So communications were opened up wide. The talk about money and making a living was something that began to be regular everyday conversations because of Randolph. And Byard Rustin, who was the one who really did a lot of the work as well, talked about classic education in a way that everyone could get on board and learn what it meant to be self-sufficient and to restore that pride and dignity that began to slip away in bigger numbers as we became closer as a community and developed ways and means for making our own way along. Now, Randolph understood that it meant raising the voices. You heard that from a lot of the presenters before. You can't just talk in your own little clique and expect something to change, because all of y'all are already on the same accord. But Randolph took the position of if we're going to not just talk about it and be about it, you have to talk to the people that can bring about the change that you are seeking. Somebody said earlier in the presentations during the course of these two days, you gotta have a plan, and you gotta tell them what you want, right? Well, Randolph was real clear that if black men could go to war, they ought to be able to be a part of everything that the military got, Kabish. They had benefits, they had retirement, they had a place to go for things that, rec that gave them an, uh, an entree into housing, into a number of things that they were shown appreciation for the services that they gave. Didn't happen automatically until he asked for what we wanted and threatened to strike in 41 if we didn't get it. But you gotta have friends in high places. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the president at that time and the magic weapon was Eleanor. Sister girl was there for the movement. She was there for the cause and she spoke up. Plus she was bigger than him. So it didn't really matter whether he agreed or not. We got her help. And Mary McLeod Bethune, a wonderful Sora in the sorority of Delta Sigma Theta, thank you sisters, uh, <laughs> made clear the story to her about why it was important. And Eleanor stepped up to the plate and Franklin did what he was supposed to do in the first place. So we were then given access to the military for those men, if they were good enough to fight, they were good enough to earn all of the benefits that were there for them. Now. If, if, you know, we take a look at the question that got raised about the ballot, the book, you know, the buck, all things are <laughs> automatically connected. Don't you feel good when you got a pocket full of money? Your attitude don't change. Y'all start stepping in that pimp step in a heartbeat, boy, the head gets a swag and the hips get to rolling, everything starts to feel all right. But when those dollars run out, is oh Lord have mercy, now today's Tuesday, I got to make it to Friday, what am I going to do? 
It's about really looking at things, appreciating it, and understanding the linkage, but not just in your pocketbook, but in the general pop pocketbook of the population that we represent and in the communities where we live. All of the discussion around housing, around climate change, around all the issues that have been brought forward are absolutely linked just to that, just to that. It's not complicated and it doesn't have to be given in highfalutin terms. I couldn't give them to you that way anyway because I'm country and I ain't ashamed of it. But understanding exactly what every bit of your own civil acts really result in, that's a wealth right there. If you know that what you bring to the table by your civic duty, you are a wealthy person, and the feeling that you get back from that is something that you cannot just simply toss away. If that were the case, labor movements and labor activists would have never brought things to us, you know, a long time ago. Now, if you look at the sponsors board, you'll see that we are up there, right? APRI is up there, NEA is up there, SEIU is up there, and a lot of other labor groups want to do the coalescing that's necessary in order to help the cause. Because most labor members are activists in their communities as well. And in doing so, they bring to the table the things that labor has for the members as a general piece of information so that you'll know the difference between belonging to a union and not belonging to a union. But also we get from the community that it's not a part of that labor community what's important. Because like they said, if the, if the information that's being given is not clear or understood by the giver and the receiver between the two, you're lost, it's just wasted space. Understanding that you do not have to have a PhD in order to make a good living. A lot of folks with a college degree don't make as much as a plumber, or an electrician, or someone who's in the building trades. And when we started to get the feedback about some of the folks who were walking with degrees, I have one from FAMU, proud of it. Mm -hmm. But there you go, some rattlers in the house, all right. But when I left school, I expected that piece of paper to do some magic for me. Mm -hmm. I ended up in the same place where I wanted to be from the beginning, in the labor movement. Because I was scared of my mama and she was a labor activist, six feet tall in her stocking foot and could cuss better than anybody in this room. But understanding the linkage between organized labor, organizing in your community, labor and its impact on your everyday life, and the results of what comes out of that is something that we have to really make clearer and make everybody live up to it. I don't know that many of you know everything that comes from the piece. You can tell old school from new school. I got pieces of paper here. Everybody yeah. else got their computers. And Kay, yeah, we got and I'm gonna I'm wrap it up right now, okay? But, and I say that to say this. Just a few things that came out of what we do. Um, Lou, I lost your cheat sheet that you gave me. But talking about the eight hour day, talking about the benefits for overtime, talking about uh, health benefits, talking about the right to say no and let no mean no on a job because you should not leave your dignity at the door when you walk in any place for a job. <laughs> not one time. But as we go through the discussion, I hope I could bring a little bit more to the table. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you, Clay. Thank you, Clayola Brown, President A. Philip Randolph Institute. Jocelyn Fry. So, Jocelyn. Uh, let's focus specifically on blacks in the workforce. Even though black women often have the highest rate of labor force participation among all women, they experience significant disparities compared to their white counterparts. What are these disparities and do they impact wealth for black women and what needs to be done to connect them? And I didn't say correct them. I want you guys just kind of keep them as short as you can because I want to come back to you all for one more question before we wrap up this panel. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for your leadership, and it's wonderful to be here on this panel. Um, and I will uh, answer your question. Um, I, I want to start by saying uh, that um, a piece of your question, which is about black women workers and how they tend to have the highest labor force participation, and I want to start with that point because I think there is a narrative about black women workers that is completely contrary to the reality. 
most times when you look at the workforce, black women have the highest labor force participation. They experience a number of disparities in terms of their wages, in terms of the benefits they have access to, in terms of whether or not they're in the highest level jobs and the type of work they access. But I think it's important to start with labor force participation because I think it's important to be clear that the disparities that they experience have nothing to do with their willingness to work. You know, black women have worked in this country from the moment they set foot in this country. They are often the hardest workers. They have worked for often the lowest pay, um, and they continue to do so. So to the extent that they are experiencing disparities, and I will speak really quickly about disparities in wages and benefits and jobs, um, uh, and, and say those really quickly, um, uh, it is not due to their to their capacity or their willingness to actually do the work and very much is connected to other factors that drive those disparities. So a couple of quick numbers. If you look at black women workers, if you look at full-time workers, black women earn 67 cents to their white male counterparts. If you look at all women workers, black women workers, so including not only full-time but part-time, that is 64 cents to uh, their white male counterparts parts. If you look at their unemployment rate, there's been a lot of conversation about low unemployment rates for black workers, which is good, but it is also relative to their counterparts. The unemployment rate in April of 2023 for black women was 4.4 percent. In comparison to women, 3.1 percent. In comparison to white women workers, it's 2.8 percent. So while it is low and at its historic lows, which we appreciate, it is also relative to their counterparts, there is still a disparity. If you look, as I said, at labor force participation, black women have higher labor force participation, close to 64%. That's in comparison to white women at 57.5%. Um, uh, Latinas is a little bit higher at 61.2%. Um, the point is that historically, black women have the highest labor force participation. That was true during the pandemic, even when you saw incredible drops in, in women's labor force participation overall, black women continue to have the highest labor force participation of all those women. Um, when you look at the wage gap over a lifetime, um, it's close to a million dollars for black women in terms of lost earnings um, uh, over a 40-year career. Um, so that's a lot of money um, that people can't afford to lose simply because of a, a wage gap. In comparison, if you look at white women, they're also losing money, but not as much, closer to 500, a little over $555,000. So women generally are losing money over a 40-year career because they experience a pay gap, black women experiencing more. Um, what that means in terms of their benefits is that black women who are disproportionately more likely, particularly black moms, to be breadwinners in their families often don't have access to leave in order to care for those families. I know Carol will speak more about that. In a typical year, a little over a million black women need leave, but they can't take it because they can't afford to take off unpaid leave or they don't have access to it. If you look over the course of a year, black women uh, either lose wages um, uh, up to uh, an estimated $3.9 billion uh, in lost income each year because they lose wages because they either have no access to paid leave or they have very poor access, very low income that they're getting when they take leave. The last stat that I'll give you is just that if you look at occupations where black women work, um, where you would think that they would be paid equitable wages, early childhood educators and child care workers, black women earn about 76% of what their white female counterparts earn. So you see across wages, across jobs, across access to benefits, black women are consistently experiencing disparities. I'm sure we will talk more about what some of those solutions are, but suffice to say, we need to focus on what the problem is. One is you, know, you need to raise wages, particularly in the jobs where black women work. They disproportionately are wa lower wage jobs, so it's not simply raising the minimum wage, it's really raising the quality of those jobs and raising those wages even higher. It needs to also be focused on discrimination in those jobs. Um, you know, clearly when you talk about 
jobs where black women have historically worked over their entire lives, but they're still experiencing disparities. There's something else going on. So it is important to call out you know, anti-black racism and anti-discrimination efforts as a strategy, as a mechanism to improve black women's outcomes. Um, and also moving black women into higher paying jobs. There's a lot of focus on non-traditional jobs, construction jobs, production jobs. There, there are millions and millions, trillions of dollars going into those jobs at the moment, um, but they disproportionately exclude women. Um, but yet, even in those jobs, historically, black women are paid less. So it is important to not only get them into those jobs, but also ensure that those jobs are actually, as uh, uh, Ms. Brown said, actually paying people fairly and treating people fairly on those jobs. The very last point I will make um, is that um, is really uh, where Ms. Brown left off and what our pr uh, previous speakers have spoken about is, you know, black women's um, employment and their wage disparities are very much connected to other issues. Black women um, are disproportionately caregivers in their families. So if they don't have access to benefits, they're gonna take time away from work and are gonna experience job losses and income losses. Black women's economic stability is connected to reproductive rights. It's connected to the, you know, if, if they're forced to have children, um, which they are now are in several states, then they're going, it's going to impact their wages. There's data that shows that um, and their economic standing. So we have to be, I, I'm so glad this convening is happening because we do have to get outside of our issue silos. Um, you know, these are not simply women's issues. Uh, you know, I often say if you're not solving the, it's not just about solving the, the gender pay gap. If you're not solving the black women's pay gap, then you're not solving the pay gap, right? Like we have to center women of color and particularly black women in many of these economic narratives in order to ensure that the solutions we're coming up with actually work for black women. Thank you, Jocelyn. Okay, time, time, time. Time is our friend. Say time is our friend. So here we're gonna do time is our friend. Uh, uh, panelists, if I walk up like this. Thank you, thank you. And that's my fault, I, I did not do that. All right, I'm gonna ask uh, Jocelyn Tate, um, as well as Paula Hoisington, who's the CEO of National Black Caucus of State Legislators, uh, started with Jocelyn to, to respond to the same question from different perspectives. For decades, access to high-speed internet at home was considered a luxury item. Why is equitable connectivity to high-speed internet now being considered a priority alongside other critical infrastructure assets like water, trans transportation, and, le and electricity? What needs to be done to advance digital equity and connectivity in the black community? And I don't know if you can get all this in in five minutes, but. It also, how what's that um, the, the impact really on economic uh, security and opportunity? Um, and so I know some, okay. this is a deep question. Okay. <laughs> um, because there's a lot to it, but we got to okay. stick with that five and I'll go to, to, to I, Paula, I, you and Paula. I think I Paula can do it in five. Okay. Um, Thank you. First of all, uh, and thanks for the question. First of all, affordable access to broadband can be really an equalizer in closing that way and closing the wage gap for black Americans because it provides us with education, uh, entrepreneurship opportunities, jobs, health care that can keep us healthy and living and working. So all of these things raise the tide for the black, uh, in the black community to help us close that wealth gap. Now, one of the things that is happening now that I'm, I'm just so excited about is with the Infrastructure Investment and Job Act, which is a $1.2 trillion of money being invested in infrastructure in this country. Let me say that again for the people in the back. 
1.2 trillion with a T. Uh, this money is being invested in this country in the infrastructure and this is the first time that broadband has been considered a critical infrastructure in this country. It is no longer a luxury. So we need that affordable broadband in our communities to bring jobs, entrepreneurship opportunities, where people can create jobs in their homes, online, uh, to, to feed their families. Um, so one of the things that is in this Infrastructure Act is uh, affordable broadband and broadband access for the country. Now I just want to speak really quickly about two of the programs that are really important for helping to close the, the wage gap in our communities. Um, and they're being administered now by the uh, National Telecommunications uh, Information Administration. One is the Broadband Equity and Access Development, um, a broadband, ac broadband Equity Access and Development Act. This is $4.25 billion with a B for the people in the back. This money is being funneled down from the federal government to the states to build out broadband in areas where it has been, where, it, where people have been underserved and unserved in our country. And that is a lot of black communities, rural communities in our, in our country. So, and the other program is what's called, I'll just say that it's the BEAD program. And what it is, it's, it's programs that help with digital literacy. Because it's one thing to bring broadband to your door, but if you don't know how to use it, then it's really of no use to you. If you don't see the relevance of it, it's no use to you. So these progr two programs in conjunction are bringing broadband to areas where it hasn't been before, making it no longer a luxury, making it as, as commonplace and as a necessity as having indoor plumbing. You wouldn't think of buying a home in this country now that didn't have indoor plumbing. So now broadband access is considered. You wouldn't think of having a home without broadband access. It's just as much a necessity. Now, how can these things close the wage gap? One, uh, one, they are providing subgrants through these dollars that I was telling you about for entrepreneurs, uh, black black contractors. These programs will provide subgrants for people as they're building out. They need people who can. Uh, build, build towers. Uh, and, and when you think of broadband, you think, well, okay, maybe I have a business, but I, I don't have any technical skill, so how can that help me? They need, H, they need HR uh, staffing companies, okay? They need people, people in all different types of aspects that are going to help to bring this to bear. And not just in, in, in broadband, all of these, all of these infrastructure grants uh, this infrastructure money that's being funneled down to the states, building out uh, unleaded pipe, uh, oh, leaded pipes. I'll, I'll go on on the next question. But anyway, this is what is going to close the way, uh, broadband access will help to close the wage gap in the black community. Thank, thank you, Jocelyn. And I know, as I can say, there's a lot to it. But I did want to uh, shout out our sister Michelle Cover, who's here, Director of Strategic Alliances with Verizon. Wave your hand, sister, uh, who's one of our partners, uh, one of the first funders of the Institute. So we're so glad you're in the room. Paula, and here's what I'm going to do to be fit, to make sure I'm not, I'm not cheating. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> thank, thank you, Melanie, for this opportunity. I bring you greetings from Representative Laura Hall, who serves as our national president from the great state of Alabama, and all of our plus 800 African-American black legislators across this country. Jocelyn has given you an overview of the dollars that are out there and the programs that are out there. But like she said, if we don't educate our cons my constituents for my legislators, your neighbors in your neighborhood of these opportunities and how it impacts your daily life. I think one thing that COVID taught us was the need for technology and how many of our communities, our children were shut off and left behind because of failure to access. I've been having this conversation when I was lobbying 18, 20 years ago about the digital divide. And here it is, 2023, we are still talking about communities that are not connected 
and the impact that it has on our communities. I have a slogan that I use with my legislators that my job as a national office is to ensure that our legislators have the tools in the toolbox before the job is there. So the tool right now is depending on our partners, our corporate partners, as you mentioned, Michelle from Verizon, ensuring that the programs that Jocelyn are talking about, that my, edu my legislators know about those programs, know where the dollars are coming down in their states and how to trickle it down into the mayors and the counties and the cities and how do we get this institute? Because I'm telling you all, if we don't get ahead of this and become engaged and not just having conversations here, but having tangible follow-ups of what we need to do six months from now, a year from now, because those dollars are coming down. And we don't want to have those conversations of trying to catch up because it's us that's being left behind. And that's what our goal is with the National Black Caucus of State Legislators is ensure that our members have the information, know the programs, know the deadlines, so that we can communicate with the different organizations and work together. There's strength in numbers, and we need to learn how to partner. They said early this morning about loving your neighbor and understanding and leaving attitudes behind. Because if we don't, we're gonna still be that group of people that will be left behind. And our children are being left behind in school. It's hard enough with books being taken from them, but if they don't have access to gain that knowledge at home and not have to drive into a McDonald's parking lot to get access, it's on us. Every one of us in, our, in this room have, has a role to play. Representative Mitchell, our past president, mentioned yesterday about getting engaged, knowing who your state legislators and senators are, having these conversations. How can my group get involved? How can we bring these dollars into our communities? Like she said, there's work to be done on every level in this infrastructure bill. Billions of dollars, our opportunity to get there and be ahead. Thank you. Anthony Tony. Tony Wilder with the National Urban League. How is the National Urban League engaging black people on policy issues in order to hold state and federal legislators accountable for the equitable implementation of legislation and addressing the causes of the wealth gap in the black community? Well, first and foremost, uh, Melanie, I wanna thank you for this invitation to this panel as well as this inaugural event. It's been quite illuminating and it feels good to be amongst people who care and work for black people. Um, you kind of put me in a spot because I'm right next to a legislator, so hopefully. Oh, she's good. She got. She's good. She was. She. She. Hopefully, she's, I don't she's get a, a pinch. She's good. We family. All right. So first and foremost, I think we have to stress that the biggest threat to building Black economic equity in this country is the idea that we're going to get there by equality. Um, because a lot of the policies that are, Im that are implemented, they are implemented in a lens that does not take into account the historical injustices that we have suffered um, in the economic space. So we definitely urge and we um, prod our legislators to not uh, introduce um, race neutral policies that do not take into account that historically that policy and practice has um, excluded, has exploited, and has also um, neglected the black community in their efforts to gain um, wealth in this country. So um, at the Urban League, we are equally intentional in making sure that we are pushing um, targeted policies um, that focus on inequities in promoting, in hiring, in um, uh, access to um, capital through lending institutions as well. So how are we doing this? Uh, on the front end, what we want to make sure that we're doing is advocating for specific language to be written into our bills and our laws and our policies that remove these structural obstacles and address the disadvantages that black people and black businesses have experienced in this country. 
Uh, and we also advocate for resources to provide trusted community partners, um, like many of the organizations that are here today, uh, to be given targeted outreach to the community members as well as the businesses that are most impacted by economic downturns um, and also giving them um, the opportunity to get those messages from people that they trust. Um, that's one of the things that we deal with. We want to partner with our government agencies and be a trusted voice to make sure that the benefits are given to those who need it most. And lastly, we advocate that they prioritize um, including minority-led and minority-centered serving institutions, um, financial institutions in particular, into the equation. Um, we want to make sure that we don't have a situation that we had with the rollout of the COVID uh, relief packages where um, many of our black businesses and black neighborhoods did not get um, approved for PPP loans and those loans were um, delegated to communities like ours that are deeply impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. So um, the ways that we um, hold our elected officials accountable is to make sure that they are not doing tone deaf policy that does not address the disparities that we have experienced in this country. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Uh, two more of our uh, panelists, uh, Carol Joyner uh, uh, with Family Values Action. Uh, we know we recently celebrated the 30 year anniversary of the Family Medical Leave uh, Act, FMLA, which gives workers 12 weeks of unpaid leave if they become seriously ill or need to take time away from work to care for a family member and made sure workers wouldn't lose their jobs while on leave. FMLA was certainly a step in the right direction, but through COVID, we know why we need paid family leave. And it shouldn't have just been just for a little while, but it's part of, of wealth building. It really is, and uh, it took me a while to get there with Carol over the years to, uh, to really understand that, and I do understand that um, that uh, uh, that the reality is if, if um, okay, tell him you shut up, okay. All right. <laughs> get back to, to being a moderator, yes. Okay, <laughs> Carol, respond to that question, my sister. That's funny. Okay. Thanks. I was uh, I was afraid that that was my time already no. up. <laughs> Thank you, Mel. I really appreciate you in so many different ways, and um, I deeply appreciate your creating this institute um, that's focusing on Southern organizing, um, and for always being the person who brings people together, I think someone said it earlier, across silos, across issues, um, to, to, to address all that we need in the black community. Um, I deeply appreciate your always including care, paid leave, paid sick days, child care, as part of the economic um, you know, requirement for black families. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm thrilled to sit next to my sister in, in uh, the movement, Jocelyn Fry. Um, mainly because we're going to be, I'm going to start, talk a little bit about FMLA because we actually have moved on from that. <laughs> but I can't sit here without acknowledging that the National Partnership drafted the FM, FMLA policy uh, 30 years ago, 37 years ago, right? It took seven or eight years to get it done. Um, and that, you know, we have built in many states on that policy to get to paid family and medical leave. And so Family Values at Work Action is a fairly new, three years old, uh, C4. And we are the sister organization to Family Values at Work, which is a network of 27 state coalitions working on paid time to care, paid family and medical leave, paid sick and safe days, child care availability, um, and increasingly we've included um, home and community-based services because elder care is real. Um, and we, we've been focused on these issues for, this, this year will be our 20th year, but the C4 is fairly new. 
And I just want to get to this part about FMLA. We celebrated the 30th anniversary with tremendous fanfare at the White House. It was pretty amazing. Um, but I also remember celebrating the 20th anniversary of FMLA, because I'm old enough for that. And I actually remember when FMLA was signed into law. So like, y'all can start adding up and figure out my age. Um, what I do know is that for all of those 30 years, FMLA has been a powerful tool for working families, for some working families. Um, 465 million people have used FMLA over the last 30 years. And that's a huge number, but realize only half the population has access to it. The other half doesn't. They have no access whatsoever because they work for a smaller employer. An employer with 50 or fewer employees, they're not eligible. They don't, they don't have to comply, right? And then of those 50% who have had access to FMLA, FMLA is unpaid leave. So think about how far your money goes. We're talking about the, the bucks here, right? How far those bucks go if you're paying all of your expenses and you don't have a check coming in. Um, and so the 12 weeks that people use for unpaid leave is, has been helpful to about half the population at any given time. It also, though, most importantly, has included job protection. So it, is, it says essentially that you, when you take paid leave, if you're eligible, have the right to your job, which is huge, right, if you can afford to take it. The impact on black families that have not had access to FMLA or don't have access to paid family and medical leave, which I'll talk about in a second, has been tremendous. Um, 3.9 billion black women lose wages due to uh, caregiving overall, caring for themselves, caring for a sick family member, welcoming or bonding with a new child. As Jocelyn told us, somewhere, somewhere up to like 65 percent of black women are sole or primary wage earners. And so the money is not available to take care of your family when you have to take leave, and sometimes leave is not an option. It's a necessity. Imagine a person who has to have a hip replacement. Imagine a person who has a child. Imagine a, a, a father who's lost his job, you know, due to some you know, catastrophic illness. So you really do have to take leave when, when, when you need it. Um, what we have, what I'm just trying to say on time here, I know I'm probably running out. What, um, okay, what? <laughs> um, the stories that we have sort of, just, just to illustrate this a little bit, the stories that we have heard are around job stability when you lack paid leave, around economic threats, your house, your car, your child's school tuition, around the transfer of wealth that we've heard about in this conference a lot, the ability to actually keep that money in your 401k so that you can transfer it later on to you know, your heirs or keep whatever money you've saved, the investments. One major illness wipes all of that out. One period of time without getting income and all of that is gone. And so um, the, right now, we are, we're dealing with, uh, we have leaders all over the country and many of them have been very vocal around paid family and medical leave. There's a film called Zero Weeks. You can see it on Prime. And in that video, you get to meet some of the folks and what's happened to them because they didn't have paid leave. Around the country, we have fought, okay, around the country, we have fought for paid leave for the last 20 years. And so right now, if I include Minnesota, which signed a law literally this uh, last week, um, there are 13 states, including DC, that have a paid leave law, where you can actually take time off and get your pay while you stay home to care. Okay, um, let me just say one more point, one more point. There are several bills that I will talk about and I hope I get to talk about later to address this issue nationally. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. You know I don't want to cut you off, but we, we, we gotta, we gotta. Last and certainly not least, the brother on the group. Uh, who appreciate him so very much uh, and has worn many hats, uh, including, included in the business community. Um, so uh, we're gonna hear from our brother with this question. 
Mr. Milton Jones Jr., 100 Black Men of America's hat today uh, with, with the mentoring and engagement with black youth. Uh, you all keep your finger on the pulse of, of the needs of black young people uh, across this country. Uh, what are black youth thinking? What are you all hearing from young people when it comes to this issue around economic empowerment uh, and economic justice? Uh, not just jobs, but entrepreneurship. And, uh, and, and where do we go? And uh, I'm gonna, I've added a young man to come up I wanna just introduce and give him some love, uh, who happens to be Mary Pat Hector's young brother who's been an entrepreneur since he was how old? Since he was nine. And we wanna lift him up. Right. And I think that's a good way. So Brother Milton. Well, thank you very much, here. Melanie. And, and thank all of you on the panel. It's been very eye-opening and, and everybody's got a lot of passion. And, I'm, and I don't have a lot of time, apparently. So <laughs> with that said, I'll have to, I'll have to bridle my passion um, into these few minutes. As we reach out to the, to the young people that we work with, what we find is that the game has changed quite a bit. 30 years ago, or 25 years ago, when I joined the 100, our main focus was to talk to young people and to show them that college was the way to salvation. College was the way to success. College was the way to close the wealth gap. What we've learned is that college is, does continue to be important, but it's not the only determinant of how gap, wealth gaps get closed. But our young people have taught us, and what we all have, are learning together, is that entrepreneurialism is a way to salvation, entrepreneurialism is a way to close the wealth gap, and entrepreneurialism is a way to make sure that we have you know, opportunities that are fair in a level playing field. The fact is it's both. And so if you wanted to kind of sum it up, you could say this. If you feel that you are so good and strong that you can take all the risk in the world, skip college, pursue your dream, build a business, go out there and make it happen. If you want a way to have more options, should that not work, do that and go to college. And so the, the, it's not one or the other, they can be compatible. That said, uh, there are so many ways to generate business uh, revenue today that didn't exist 5, 10, 15 years ago. And what we have to do is encourage that. What we have to do is make sure that the federal, state, and local policies that exist from a standpoint of taxation, government, what's allowed and what's not, et cetera, are all fairly distributed, that they don't kind of slant against us or against what we tend to do. There was some discussion earlier about jobs that go away. Uh, as a result of changes that we see. Uh, let's just make sure policies don't make that happen. And then what I will say is that let's talk about the size of this wealth gap. All right, the size of this wealth gap is immense. Average household, median household wealth for white households is $188,000. Median household wealth for black households is 24,000, okay? You look at that difference and say if the wealth gap is that wide, Take 5% off that 188, that's a lot of political buying power we don't have. Take 5% off our 24, we don't really do but so much. So what we've got to do is, is increase that. We've got to increase it by making sure that we to, uh, totally focus on, I mean, that we focus in sufficiently on economic empowerment in ways that go beyond sort of the, the, the handout, but really get to how do we broaden you know, the opportunity the avenues that need to be broadened across all cycles, all, all areas of, of activity, healthcare, um, manufacturing, uh, goods and services, all, you know, and, and, and by the way, you can start a business in some pretty interesting ways. The other thing we have to make sure is the case is that, as was brought up earlier, we gotta make sure that access to capital and access to debt is also something that we keep our eye on and we continue to press on. It's hard to build a business. It's hard, you can build a business on, on a shoestring, but if you're gonna scale it and turn it into a booming business that hires others and drives the economy, then you're gonna have to have an ability to do that. And that's gonna require equity and debt. And so access to those markets, understanding those markets is critical to making sure we make a, we make a positive difference. I'm gonna yield what time I have left to this young person here to pick up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Maurice Rund. I am a serial entrepreneur. Um, for your newcomers to Atlanta, if you are in the DeKalb area on Snapfinger Road, we have, I have a restaurant. 
I have a restaurant called Mason Superdogs, open uh, from 11 to 6, Tuesday to, uh, to Saturday. So if, you, if you're hungry and you want some gourmet hot dogs, um, stop by. Also, if you have a um, business that may need a vending machine, I do vending machines, just let me know. And I will drop a vending machine off, just let me know what type. And I am also a Black Youth Vote um, Fellow. And I learned about voting. Oh, um, I also just uh, got an I'm going to go get an award from Black Enterprise, so. Oh, so um, if you, uh, yes, and, um, but, and watch the magazine. Okay. So, um, oh, I am 16 now. I started my business when I was nine years old and I didn't ha have any money, so I had to have um, seeding businesses, like walking dogs and washing cars and mowing lawns. It, the reason why I didn't stick with those businesses is because um, I, I forgot I'm in Georgia in the summer and mowing lawns in 100 degree weather. I, did, I stopped walking dogs because, well, uh, when you're walking dogs, per, you should probably do it one at a time. I had about five customers. They had two dogs each. They were not small dogs. And they love to chase squirrels, and they will drag you around the entire neighborhood. Uh, Thank you. And this is what you call, like, this is what's happening in our young people. And that's what I saw him in the audience. Go ahead. Oh, and uh, if you have a young person who wants to start a business, I also teach youth entrepreneurs, how to not only have a business, but maintain a business as a program called the Kids and Teens Business Fair, where every once a month after we teach the kids how to have a business, maintain a business, create a business, and to follow it all the way through. We walk them through the entire program. So if you, if you have anyone who, who wants to start a business, just let me know. Mason, yes, listen. We're gonna need you, shameless plug, for the Institute while I'm up here. One of the projects that will come out of the Institute uh, for our economic empowerment is that we will be having a entrepreneurship program for the area, in the immediate area of the AUC, where we want college students to, to train high school students in entrepreneurship. So you will be one of those experts, if you don't mind, uh, Mary Pat and your mom in, in the house. What's mom? Come on up, stand up, stand up so everybody can see you. Stand up, Mom. And, and, and panel, I know I said I could do a second question, but I honestly can't. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you have any other solutions, that you then, then put them out there. We, this is not the end, right? Um, but I do apologize because of time and a lot of folks got flights. We have to hear from our state leaders who are the affiliates of the coalitions and our state partners and some of our new friends that are, that are here that we had to keep shifting this part of the, of, the, of the convening that's really at the crux of it. And that was about solutions. We've done some of that through the panel. But can we give our panel a great thank you round of applause. And now we're gonna bring up, and again, if you need a break, get up and keep, keep, uh, keep it going. Uh, but we're gonna bring up Makani Timba, who's the chief strategist uh, for Higher Ground Strategies. Did I have that? We gotta shift anyway, we gotta shift, we gotta shift anyway. So Makani, are we taking a picture? I'm taking a picture. Turn it over to you. Maryland's here, right? Take it down there. Yeah. Good. Okay. You don't need my stuff, right? No, no, I got it. Okay. All right, family, here we go. I'm hoping that um, you brought your own interactivity to this. Deborah Scott and I, we, we plotting, we, we, there's a bunch of us plotting. We know that we're gonna continue to meet, to work, because this is what we do. Um, I'm gonna call up state reps to come up and give us a little bit of a taste. 
of what you're thinking. And again, I see, it looks like, is that Georgia winning with the most post-its? I'm just saying. I'm like, come on, Mississippi. Come on, my people. What are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> So there are post-its at your table. We want to continue to hear your ideas. We'll take pictures of everything that goes up. You'll see your state name. Looks like somebody pulled a curtain on one of the states, but, um, but we'll just pull that curtain back if, you can, if we can't see Virginia. All right, family, so I'm going to call up a few states, ask you to come share very quickly. You know how we do. If you're in the house, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Maryland, come on up. Come on up. Let us see you. Okay, not too loud, though, because there we go. Alabama, Florida. They may be all gone. Okay. Okay. My folks is here. I'm my young All right. Come on. Come on. Represent Florida. I, I heard Alabama had to leave. Oh, we got. Um, you need to do it right now. Oh no. I, yeah. This is this is just a part of the states. Not all of them. Not all of them, fam. Not all of them. So, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Maryland. If you're here, come on up. All right, we're going to kick it off with Florida. A hand for Florida. Come on. We haven't put our post-it notes up yet, but we do have solutions. And part of my solution is I don't just talk the talk, but I brought my young people that's actually doing the work doing the work in Florida, transitioning, and so my, as a leader, I'm supporting the young workers, the young leadership, and whatever they need to do. And so I'm gonna pass it on to. Okay, perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Jasmine Bernie Clark, founder and consulting director of Equal Ground Education Fund and Equal Ground Action Fund in Florida. We are a black-led, community-centered uh, voting rights organization that exclusively works to protect and expand the voting rights of black Floridians. Um, and so two of the things we thought about that we need as most immediate needs in the state um, around our work is to build a long-term and a short-term coordinated plan for building capacity and maintaining it. Florida had a $58 million investment in 2020, and it went down to a $1.3 million investment in 2022. So there was a concerted effort to divest from Florida, and we see what the results of that divestment look like, and so we need to get back to parity in order for um, us to be able to compete, given the fact that two of our presidential candidates are coming from the state of Florida. The second thing is that we need to build a black bench of candidates, campaign staff, strategists, and consultants yes. in the state of Florida. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. 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 Hello everyone, I'm Cassandra Brown and I am the co-founder and executive director of All About the Ballots out of Florida and a few things that we are working on, of course, is bringing the black vote back home. We should not have to leave our communities to go to evangelical white churches to vote. We should be able to vote in our own communities. So what we'll be doing is identifying black churches and if they need help as far as raising funds to make their location um, eligible to be a polling location, we will work with them on that. We will let them know what the criteria is to become a voting location and try to bring that vote back to our communities. Another thing that we focus on is meeting our communities where they are. So one thing we definitely want to do is meet the mothers at the daycares. We will provide dinner for them so that they don't have to go home and worry about feeding their families, but for that hour or so, we can educate them on things like Medicaid expansion, how that affects them and their families and their children. We will also educate them around the um, banning of the books because this will definitely affect their children. We will also discuss our voting rights. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 
And you know what? I, we were going in alphabetical order, but we all good. So, um, what you so what you trying to do, Miss Felicia? Deborah Scott. Okay, so then with, let us go to Louisiana then. So Demetrius Fisher with the Legal Women Voters of the U.S. Um, with um, support for the southeastern states. Um, and for Louisiana, what specifically our group talked about, just like Florida was, um, that youth voice. Uh, we see a lot of great organizations up here, but we're missing that youth component. A lot of times we sit in these strategy sessions and make um, plans and decisions for young people uh, with them in mind, but with them not in the room. So we need to be a little bit more intentional to make sure that we have their voice here, especially being that we're on a college campus. And secondly, the other piece we uh, were talking about to make sure that we have a solid plan uh, for the engagement of black media and black media groups as we talk about this black and be able to create messages that speak to the black community. All right. Go ahead, set an example. What's up, Georgia? Okay, so Georgia. Uh, I'm just going to open by saying that uh, clearly we wear multiple hats, switching in and out of them. And I am the convener for Clayton County Black Women's Roundtable, so I have the opportunity to work side by side with Helen Butler and the Georgia Coalition for a People's Agenda and Deborah Scott with Georgia Stand Up. And what we vote, we win. And we together have been instrumental in changing Georgia. So a lot of people take credit from the broader arena, and some of whom are elected. I can say in Clayton County, we have the largest delegation of black women elected officials in the nation, in the entire nation. And so with that, I've been bouncing in and out. So I can pass it over to um, Deborah Scott. What I can say is that in terms of organizing, for us it's been door to door, activity to activity, relentless day in and day out. And there, we do have a lot of challenges this time around on the ground, but we engage young people, working people, employed people, unemployed people, people that are in the community. Clayton County is predominantly black and what we do is black. Our vibe is black and we turn out black people to vote. And so with that, I pass it with a tap on my back to my good sister on the right. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. I am a proud graduate of Clark Atlanta University. <laughs> yes, when it was Clark College. Um, I'm actually in the first graduating class of Clark Atlanta University, in the last graduating class of Clark College. Um, so it's good to be home 40 years. Um, so just very quickly, a lot has been said about the youth, and a number of the stickies on here deal with the youth, and that they should be funded and respected, and their opinions should be heard, and their they should be setting the agenda. Um, a lot on a 10-year plan. We need a 10-year plan to flip states and to um, modify our economic situation. So we need to take the data that we're learning here um, and make a 10-year plan for each of the states. Um, the other things like connecting HBCUs to labor, to community, to um, the faith-based community. So we want to have convenings in each state um, to talk about how we can move power. This is an off year but it's always an on year here in Georgia. We are working in collaboration with a lot of groups and we are just recommending that everyone who has a C3 also get a C4 and then connect to the PACs that are out there as well. Um, so we're trying to move power and, and we're looking at it as a power analysis, a power dynamic, and then a power shift. All right, thank you. Alabama in the house, thank you. Thank you, so I am Cramarian D. Anderson hyphen Harvey. I am the state director. I work out of DC for the human rights campaign, but I actually run the state of Alabama, so I am Southern grease and butter at the same time, you understand. 
Um, so a couple of things that um, I would like to share is, is that Alabama is very unique in how we come together and how we are organizing. So one, we all know Commissioner Sheila Tyson, who has been leading our work around our voters in regards to prison and our jail um, system. And so that has been going so great that we last cycle for election, we had more incarcerated individuals being able to vote and cast their votes because of her work. So I wanted to first share that. Uh, we also have a C3C4 table um, in Alabama um, that particularly focuses on our black issues, but voters is number one. I serve as the chair of our C4 statewide table along with my job with the Human Rights Campaign. But these are a couple of things unique about us is that because I'm HRC and I'm a remote office of HRC, Alabama has the privilege to make sure we are defining not just black and black culture, yes. but also intersectionality. Yes. And we've been hearing that all day around other intersectionality that's been missing, such as LGBTQ+, and all the others, such as homelessness, which we have not even spoke about as it relates to voting. But, but making sure that we're doing not just social justice in Alabama, but we're doing intentional justice. Okay, and then the last two things is, is that um, we had the privilege of, of last voting cycle to ensure that our poll workers were culturally competent and humility. What was happening was in Alabama, because of our legislative that was passing in regards to anti-LGBTQ legislation, um, trans-identified individuals being turned away from voting in the polls because of their identification. And so we were able to train poll workers along with the help of Sheila Tyson and her group to go in and give them that cultural competency. Don't make a scene because what you see on your on the identification and what you see in present, it is still a human, it is still a voice, and we need their vote. And then finally, I would say people's first language. Um, since I have been the leader of HRC in Alabama, it is very critical that we also understand that people's first language is what they learn by before we open up the, the source and start talking our language that becomes our expertise. And then finally, representation every table and if you don't have the representation seek the representation and do your own professional development to make sure that you have a diverse coalition thank you so much you got a you got like a multi bonus there um, and y'all heard that right everybody heard that everybody said everybody we're we building black power for who everybody all right, thank you all, hands for all the states. Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama. All right, y'all y'all clap like it wasn't your state. I, I heard y'all. It's okay. All right, I'm calling up. Is there anyone from Maryland here who's repping? Okay, if not, we're not worried, we got. Mississippi, my state, come on. North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, come on up. <laughs> Y'all say it's three o'clock. <laughs> come on up. Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, if you're in the house, come on up. And as folks are coming up, know that we will be doing some Zoom meetings, some other kinds of spaces for us to plan, because we know you cannot plan for power in no 35-minute small group conversation. Is that right? We trying to win, right? Winning takes time. Here we go. I don't know what order we're in. I'm just going to call the state. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's start with North Carolina. Give North Carolina a hand. My name is Marcus Bass. I serve as the executive director for Advanced Carolina. We are a black-led C4, uh, one of the first in North Carolina. A few things that I want to mention. First of all, we don't need to give up on traditional media. I know we're broadcasting live right now across the world, but there are individuals that we need to reach that listen to the radio every single day. 
our working class population from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock and from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock are tuned into the radio. And right now, if your organization doesn't have a million dollar media budget, you can spend a fraction of that cost on local radio and get the message out to a broader segment of your community. And so that's what we're doing in North Carolina. Also, we've talked about HBCU coordination here. I want to shout out uh, Lamar Bryan. Uh, he's our regional coordinator for the Triad area. That's the Wake County area, Raleigh. So where the majority of the HBCUs are between North Carolina and Georgia, we go back and forth with the most educated black electorate in the country. We have to harness that power in a real way because the Republicans, the other individuals of the conservative uh, persuasion are doing that in some ways that may not benefit black folks. And with our nonpartisan message, we can tell the truth about policies that are taking over in these small corners of North Carolina and across the South. And I'll say this, one thing we have to do is make sure we're not just reaching young voters. You all have cousins that are gonna vote opposite of their persuasion because they're being pitted against by individuals that look like them but don't carry their issues. So don't be so caught up in missing and reaching young voters that you miss your cousin that may not vote the right way. Or your nephew or your family members that are going to some of these churches that are not preaching the sound doctrine we know needs to set our people free. The last thing I'll say is this, uh, we have a lot of printed materials. I know that we're in a digital age. Everybody has an electronic card. Half of you all won't remember the people that you saved the numbers in your card because you don't even remember their name. Don't give up on printed material. Resources that you can touch, feel, and hold will last a lot longer than something that's in your phone, and we have to do both and. And so we're excited to hear what's happening with this institute and how we can take this information back to North Carolina. In July, we're gonna be hosting the North Carolina HBCU Think Tank. That's all 10 HBCUs in tandem at one location, spreading the gospel of what you all learned here, and we wanna take this information with us. God bless you. What are we going now to South Carolina? Is that what we're doing? Huh? Yeah, come on. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, good afternoon. I'm Christina Q. I'm from South Carolina. I would, uh, my organization is, or uh, well, my company is on Q Management Group, but I'm here in the spirit of. Um, uh, bringing South Carolina to Black Women's Roundtable and to NCBCP, and so just happy to be here to represent my state. Um, all of you know that we are first in the nation, um, so we're very, very excited about that, and so that's a huge priority for us in South Carolina, and so it's a unique priority for us to maximize um, investment. I know a lot of national organizations are here, and we're not often at the table, and so one of my focuses is trying to make sure that we have, um, we build those relationships to make sure that we're making that investment in South Carolina, and one of the things that we're uh, working on right now, and it's still um, in a very much um, infant phase, is um, our um, idea on doing a Black Agenda Summit around South Carolina going into 2024, because we want to anchor that on black issues that are important to us, and so we want to partner with um, the administration, we want to partner with private organizations, companies, HBCUs, to talk about black issues um, that are focused, um, that will anchor that for the 2024, because we want to amplify those issues in coming into the um, into the 2024 presidential election. So that's one big thing that we're working on and working on that with the DNC as well. Um, also, we just made history with our first black woman chair um, at the South Carolina Democratic Party, my sister Crystal Spain. Yes, we love her. We're so excited um, to support her. So one of her main goals is to improve year-round voter engagement like we've talked about before and also working with Melanie and we're in conversations on starting a black women's roundtable in South South Carolina. So those are my three things. You know what? Thank you. This, let's give South Carolina a hand too. I want to double back to Virginia though, if we can. Let's give Virginia a hand. They've been hanging here. Good afternoon. My name is Krista Jones. I'm one of the co conveners for Black Women's Roundtable Virginia. In Virginia, we're in an interesting situation. We don't have off years. Um, we actually have very important legislative elections this year. So at the same time that we're preparing for our presidential and congressional elections next year, we're also working on our state legislative elections. Also in Virginia, we have very distinct parts of the state and everyone has their own personality, so that's an additional barrier sometimes in terms of working together. But at some of the panels today, we've talked about it, that exact thing, the importance of really going out of your comfort zone to reach with people. So we're in Northern Virginia, we have to be very intentional about reaching out to other parts of the state. Um, I'll say that some things that we took away are the importance of personal connections. It's been said a lot, but we have got to remember that, you know, talking to people and canvassing, getting, going a step past social media, 
that's all really important if we're really gonna build these long-term relationships and make change. Um, we also wanna take a look, closer look at the data. Just like our community is so comfortable with uh, voter registration drives and we're getting it to the point where we're becoming a little bit more comfortable with phone banking and texting, a lot of times it's not data-based and that's not the first thing that comes to mind. So we really wanna just kind of build that into our culture of really focusing on data. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that we really need to do a better job of getting a lot of this information that we've talked about today into our communities. We've already talked about doing a similar convening um, in the central part of Virginia with the strategy session, and that will really help us um, become stronger in everything we do, so thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Are you Tennessee? All right now, we get, you know we gotta go to Tennessee. Let's go to Tennessee. Greetings from Nashville, Tennessee, my hometown. I am Kara Turrence, I'm uh, founder and CEO of Turrence Political. And I'm super excited that you all are here um, convening on what we can be doing in the states. As you may be following, just a, a couple weeks ago, we had two young black state legislators uh, expelled from the legislative session. Uh, as a result of their protesting uh, gun violence. And so as we think about Tennessee, a state that at one time been very blue and democrat uh, democratic that is now um, very much um, what we would call a red state, a, a GOP governor, a, G a GOP supermajority state legislature, we talked about how important it is that we break that supermajority and how the work that is happening in South Carolina and in Virginia and in Georgia uh, the spotlight that came to Tennessee because of the pressure of other black people across the country saying this is not what democracy is, that, that duly elected black officials being simply stricken off of their duties because uh, supermajority folks on the, on the, on the right uh, didn't appreciate their right to protest and their right to speak for the voiceless was simply wrong. And so Tennessee, a state that is not a majority black state, um, saw what we appreciate, which is a lot of allyship. A lot of everybody showed up to say this was wrong. And this is wrong, not just for black people and not just for black legislators, but it's wrong for democracy. And so we encourage all of you across the country as Tennessee continues to build and rebuild, um, to keep the pressure on, to keep the focus on what's happening in these supermajority um, states that have uh, just a, a lot of overreach happening from the right on democratic cities and on all the issues that we've been talking about in the black community in a state like Tennessee that counts on allyship of not just black people because there's, there's not a majority of black people there, but it's about how do you move people that have the same uh, democratic principles on the issues together forward to really, really make policy change. And so I think Tennessee is one of those places where we're gonna be able to see a lot of the work happening here um, expand in a very broad way, both from cities like Nashville and Memphis into rural communities in between. Um, we talked about what was happening with our black farmers. The, the media pressure that um, you all are being able to do in Georgia and South Carolina and Virginia, having that come uh, and be lit on a place like Tennessee has really, really been Im impactful and powerful. And so, although we are doing the work inside the state, um, know that your presence and the work that you are doing and the pressure that you are providing is helping us be a, uh, an Achilles heel as we move forward uh, and push democracy forward in, in the volunteer state. So thank you all for that. Thank you, Tennessee. Y'all, y'all thank Tennessee. Yeah. Come on now. Last but never least, my home state, Mississippi. M I, cricket letter, cricket letter I, cricket letter, cricket letter I, humpback, humpback I. <laughs> I'm Cassandra Welchland, uh, Executive Director of the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable and Convener of the Black Women's Roundtable in Mississippi. Um, a couple of things that you know, come to mind for us is we just got out of our legislative session, and it was a very tough um, legislative session in, in Mississippi, particularly um, around our bill, um, House Bill 1020, where they were ex trying to expand um, the police presence, um, you know, in neighborhoods that are majority white neighborhoods, but taking over the police department, pretty much, really moving um, to take those rights away from the police department 
And the other thing that's very detrimental in that is taking away the right to vote for the judges that we have elected. Um, and so uh, by appointing their own judges to oversee um, the folks who might be impacted by the expanded police presence of the Capitol Police. And so right now we're currently in a fight to not make that happen because what you just said was on the ballot here for us is really democracy and our access to democracy. And so in Mississippi, we have elections every year. Every, every year, every year. And so we're never off the clock. Okay, is that me? Okay, we're never off. And so for us, it's really about educating year round, year round, connecting the dots from the policy to the people's, to people's kitchen tables and making sure that those, those um, dots are connected. So for us, that looks like really, you know, knocking on these doors right um, and connecting with people so that's the work that we are doing now partnering with our folks like one voice and NACP to help us do whole candidate forums and do boot camps around the state around the issues that matter to people because it's not the candidate it's those issues that's going to move people and I'm gonna yield my last minute to my colleague Robin Hi everybody, I'm Robin Jackson, um, Policy and Advocacy Coordinator for Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable. Um, one of the things that I want to say that is working for us is that we understand that we cannot move people if we are not looking at their issues. One of the great things about us is that we are actually providing rapid response to particular issues that are happening inside of the state of Mississippi. So we have a um, corn laundry. So if women are needing to wash their clothes for their children, they're able to come to the laundry Laundromat and to get free coins to do that. Well, while they're at the laundromat, we're talking to them and engaging them civically and giving them voter registrations. Um, we did a screening of the Little Mermaid to bring young girls and black women out to see um, different depictions of themselves inside of media. We have voter registration drives at the viewing of the Little Mermaid. What we know is that we cannot have people to move if we are not first taking care of their issues. Uh, well, I'm a mother, a new mother, and and if I can't feed my baby, I'm sorry, but I can't think about getting to the ballot. So we need to be able to say, here are some resources and some particular things that are happening and some accesses to have so that we can help people on all levels. This um, being able to help people in the democracy is being able to do it on all issues. So that's food, that's whatever they need. So that's working for us in Mississippi. And yes, I think that's my time. All right, let's give it up for Mississippi. Let's give it up for Virginia. Let's give it up for North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. And also, as, as um, folks, thank you all so much. As folks come up and we get ready to get toward the closing, I have to shout out my, the Mississippi Rapid Response Coalition and Jackson Undivided, who are also helping to lead this work on the ground. And so, as we get ready to transition, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. I'm in it to win it. Yeah. Say it like you mean it, neighbor, yeah. I'm in it to win it. Yeah. All right then, give yourselves a hand for hanging these last two beautiful days. Here we go. Here we go. And can we give another round of applause? Get a picture, Lord. You know what I want? I want all the time that black people take taking pictures. <laughs> and I'm going to go on vacation somewhere for a long time. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Guys, we'll ask you all to give us 15 minutes, because what we want to do is have a couple of highlights of what happened today. Um, but can we give our sister Makani and all of our state leaders a hand? And if you all, state leaders, will come up here at the front, we're going to take a quick picture. And while you're doing that, I would, would be totally remiss if I didn't bring up my sister, Tanya Tyson, Vice President of Operations for the National and um, Events Management from uh, the National Coalition, Tanya, to bring up the team. Getchel, come on up. 
bring up so he can give some closing remarks. Can, I, can we have the, co the coalition team come up? Who else? Did Chris came up? Oh, here. We're going to this. I'm asking for the whole NCBCP team to come on up, the professional staff and the team members. Y'all just stand right here. Y'all can get on stage. It's empty. Oops. Where you at? Mustafa. Right, he got washed. He have to wash them. Oh, okay. Angela, come on. See, now I'm in here. The institute just got you. Oh, Dr. Scott, you part of the institute team. Come on up. Okay, let me get my words together. Is Judy, Christina, and Carl? We're waiting for you all. Mustafa and Melly. Okay. Is this, this is our entire team here. McCarney, come on up. Okay. So, I once read this quote, surround yourself with women and men who will mention your name in a room full of opportunities. I am honored to be in a room full of beautiful black women and men who will mention each other's name in this room, in every room you can imagine. As the, the outstanding Reverend Tony Lee said, remember, don't only focus on the macro, that you forget to focus on the micro. I want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you here today, doing all the work every day, doing what you do. I want to also take my team who's standing here and let's give them a big round of applause because without this team, it would be no us today. Okay. And last but not least, I would like to thank our fierce president, Melanie Campbell, that knows how to pull a powerful team and coalition together. She can, we know she can call you at the last minute and you all will come. And again, we'd like to thank you, Melanie, for all of this. And <laughs> I also would like to thank all of our co-host partnering organization. Without you, we cannot get this work done. And take the time to thank all of our media partners. And again, thank everyone. Roland Martin, live, CAU TV. Yes. Right. And if anybody else I miss, who? Look at her. Okay. And again, thanks everyone for coming out and we appreciate you. And when you come to someone's house, you know, have to make sure that you say thank you. So get you, come on up and give the propers for us. Well, this has been an awesome several days. And I follow with my colleagues that there's no better work to do. If you hadn't been in working in this, if you haven't worked in this space, then you're really missing an opportunity to make a difference. Um, so I will end just simply saying, I'm proud to be woke. <laughs> I am so proud to be woke, okay? <laughs> but I also want to thank my institution, Two Clock Atlanta, for stepping up. Um, and then I'll yield to our provost. 
And I might say that it's interesting oh. that he's here yes, simply yes. because I was chair of his search committee when he was hired as Provo yes. before I retired from here. Indeed. So indeed. It was, it's good for you to be joining us today. Th thank you so much. Thank you, Ketchel. Oh, go ahead. Th uh, th thank you, uh, Ms. Campbell. Everyone, my name is Olvana Zudoka. I serve as immediate past uh, provost for Clark Atlanta University. I thank you all for being here these past two days. Uh, this is what the university is about, is to bring talent as we have around us to enrich what we do here. Uh, the real work of getting our students ready for the world of work is interacting with this kind of brain power. And we thank you for being here. We appreciate the work that you do. And please come back to CAU. Uh, we, we welcome you any day. Come back to CAU. Thank you for, uh, host, for being in, in our midst and doing this very well. And uh, I have Sam Burston, so Sam, come. <laughs> Everyone knows Sam Burston. Sam, say, say, say hello. <laughs> I've said hello already, but thank you, thank you, thank you for being here on this campus. This is a labor of love, and we think about our great friend Thomas W. Dorch Jr. I felt like Tommy was giving me orders and directions at the same time. That's what he does. So we all wanted to make sure that everything went well, and, and thank you, and we look forward to, as what they say in the South sometime, more better opportunities. Thank yes. you. But we also thank you. That's right. Uh, thank, thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and so thank, let's give all of our National Coalition our institute leaders, our co-hosts, our hosts, Clark Atlanta University, and go look at your neighbor and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look at your other neighbor and say thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Now look at your neighbor and say power of the ballot. Power of the ballot. Power of the book. Power of the book. Power of the buck. Power of For the black book. liberation. Liberation. And so this is, uh, concludes the formal part of our program. We are about to have, through, thanks to Roland Martin, uh, a, a bit of a debrief to just kind of highlight a couple of things that we think also come out of this uh, convening that's very, very important, that we send a message that we, just, we didn't just come here to talk to talk, we also here to walk to walk. And there's a couple of things that we think we need to say about the importance of going into this 2024 election um, um, before we walk out of here. And so Roland Martin is here with us all day, all the time. And so we're going to have a, uh, just a little bit of a conversation uh, about what we think needs to come out of of this convening. Uh, any board members of the National Coalition here that would like to come up to do this de media debrief, come on up. Okay. Oh, yeah, Diane, yeah. Diane, Clayola, anyone in the room? Elsie, yeah. So which one do you okay. Oh, so and if we could just, okay. Come on up, guys. <laughs> board members. Roland. <laughs> Come on up. Mm, no, no, right here, right here, y'all. We're standing. We're going to stand. We don't want to be on We don't want to be Okay, so what we like to do. Um, is uh, for those who are watching, we want to thank you uh, for watching. Uh, and so, uh, are we live in here? Are we still live in here? And so we want to be unlive on the script live screen. See, because some things we want to have family end talk. Can we can we end the broadcast and thank you all those who were watching and who stayed with us for the last couple of days? We've got a couple of ideas that we think we, 